Friday. Welcome to the AM show right here on Joy News. We are your hosts. Every day we come here and do this. And I particularly like Fridays because I like my weekends. <laughs> but That's a lovely dress. To, thank you. I look like Mary Poppins. My little sister likes to describe me as Mary Poppins. You and actually do actually this Mary morning. <laughs> So welcome aboard the AM show and in a bit I'll be serving you the news. After that we get into the news review. You've been following for a while, you know that's how we do it every day. Now for today, the National Youth Organizer of the Governing New Patriotic Party will be joining us. Salam Mustafa will be our guest for the news review. After that, Muftan Abila Abdullahi will be here to give you all the latest happenings in the world of sports. After that, you know what we are doing next. Well, after that, we get into your blunt thoughts with uh, yours truly, and I call it your blunt thoughts because I speak for many people. I'll be talking about the privatization conundrum and the things to take note of. You heard the Asante Hene, but of what he said, what are the different dimensions to it? What has happened in Ghana and in other places? What can we learn from? I will bring you details of that later on the show. And then we get into our big stories. That is where we talk about the most topical issues in the country. Today, Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Sir Sam Jonah, is asking Ghanaian journalists to actively defend the country's democracy by speaking out on critical issues impacting its governance system. Addressing the media practitioners at the launch of the 75th anniversary of the Ghana Journalists Association in Accra on Wednesday, Sir Salam Jonah emphasized the vital role of journalists as advocates for objectivity, informed discourse, and unwavering guardians of freedom and justice. So we'll get into that with Dr. Ronald Afilmoni, who is a former GJA president, Suleiman Abraima, executive director of Media Foundation for West Africa. You want to stay for that conversation? I don't know what you think, though, about what Sir Sam Jonah uh, said, yeah. his, his call on the media. Of course, we need to be more and more refined, more and more responsible. Mm. Same way we call for the same for the executive, judiciary, mm. legislature. Mm. We are the fourth arm of you know, the, the state. Fourth, state yeah. fourth realm. Uh, I don't know, but I'll be picking your thoughts on that later on the show. Now, the National Union of Ghana Students is working to ensure students have the best of conditions to study in. It's appalled by how long the teacher strike has gone on for. Uh, it's also giving its take on President Ekofuado's statement that national service personnel are underutilized. But what, what does all of this mean? We'll be engaging the NUC's President, Chairman Opong Daniel. Uh, he is our guest to later on the show on that specific matter. I find it interesting that President Okufado is saying he will, you know, this 10 year policy for the national service. Mm. Meanwhile, his vice president, exactly. Lagbera, is saying that he wants to make it optional. Where is the connection there? Are they doing to, are they moving this way or that way? It, it also <laughs> tells you yeah. that, in a way, yeah. in a way, the vice president has a point when he mm. says, I'm the driver's mate. Ah. I am not in the driver's seat. Because obviously, in some areas, he's thinking a certain way, and in other areas, uh, it appears there's some unison. It just tells you that he's not completely his own boss. Let's see how it goes today on the show. But welcome aboard. Let's get into the news now because I'm ready and you're ready. You're Mary Poppins. <laughs> This is the AM News. Details now. The Minister for Communication, Estela Owusu, has disclosed that government has increased rural cell sites from 78 to about 1,500. She says the government is also working to get 1,006 more sites built before the end of this year. She spoke at National Communications Authority's Consumer Forum held in Tamale. Martina Bugri reports. The forum organized by the National Communications Authority brought together consumers, operators and other stakeholders to back. engage. Addressing the gathering, the Minister for Communication, Osla Owusu Ekufu, said the initiatives put up by government is to help promote digital inclusion. One of the key initiatives that we're currently rolling out is the Rural Telephony Project. And I'm proud to state that as at February 2024, the number of rural telephony sites 
aimed at promoting digital inclusion and reducing the digital gap have increased from 78 at the end of 2016 to almost 1,500 currently. Work is underway to build an additional 1,006 sites by the end of this year, bringing the total amount to almost 2,500. This will connect almost 5 million citizens who currently do not have access to voice and data services and bring them into the information age. She said Ghana is partnering its neighbors on the free roaming service. Another key initiative is the ECOWAS roaming initiative. To promote regional integration and seamless communication across West Africa, in June 2023, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire implemented the ECOWAS free roaming initiative. Even though this initiative was adopted by ECOWAS in 2016, not much had been done to give effect to it until this key initiative last year. Our agreement with Cote d'Ivoire was the first of such arrangements. And so when you travel to Cote d'Ivoire, you will not have to pay expensive roaming fees to receive calls and messages. And you will send messages and make calls paying what the local Cote d'Ivoire rates are. Similar arrangements are currently being made with other neighboring countries such as Burkina Faso, Benin. And with Togo, we are set to implement this program on 1st July this year. The Chief Executive Officer of the NCA, Joe Anochi, said the authority has directed all telcos to present their backup plan to the authority. The Lands Minister Samuel Abujinapo has reiterated the world's fears that the Horn of Africa may become uninhabitable due to heat waves. He says the temperatures keep rising and this, according to United Nations, is affecting health, food production and access to water. The minister, who said this at the launch of this year's Green Ghana project, also said the grey picture being painted calls for all to join hands in planting trees. Another report by Martina Bougri. The Green Ghana Day was introduced in 2021 by government as part of an aggressive national afforestation program to restore the country's lost vegetation. The fourth edition of the program's launch was held in Tamale under the team Growing for a Greener Tomorrow. Speaking at the launch, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Samuel Abujinapo, said, the effects of climate change is already biting the savannah belt. The climate crisis is worsening by the day. We are told by the experts that last month was the world's hottest month ever recorded, surpassing July 2023, which was the hottest in the last 120,000 years. Worst of all, global temperatures have been rising for a record-breaking 10th month in a row since June last year. And I believe we can all testify to the heat we have been experiencing in the country in the last few months. South Sudan, for example, had to close down their schools due to heat waves. And there are fears that the Horn of Africa may become inhabitable due to these heat waves. Just last week, the United Nations said sorry temperatures are putting millions of children in Asia at risk of diseases and death. These rising temperatures have enormous impact on health, food production, access to water, among others, particularly for agrarian economies like ours. And as your majesty, more than any one of us can attest to, farmers in the savanna zone, the food enclave of, the, of our country, are no longer able to predict rainfall. These grim statistics call for all hands on deck approach to halt climate change and save lives and our planet. The Green Ghana Project is one of the measures the government of Ghana, under the able and distinguished leadership of President Akufuadu, has adopted to curb the incessant degradation of our forests, which has become ongoing for years without any conscious effort to replace them and to contribute to the global fight against climate change. Regional Minister Shane Al Hassan Shaibu called on all to help protect the environment. Let us embrace this moment. 
with a promise to nature and protect our environment. It is the duty of the press to make sure that our voices are heard. What happens here should be out there for others who couldn't make time to be here to be the beneficiaries of what happens here today. Each tree that we plant and all efforts to preserve our natural resources are steps towards a healthier and vibrant earth. The chief of Zangbalan, Na Jacob Mahama, who represented the overlord of Dagbo, Yana Abukari II. Now, the paramount chief of Tapa traditional area, Nana Okoforebua Kwame Asante II, is calling on the Volta River Authority to consider residents in his area in the VRA scholarship fund. He says 60 years after relocating the people of Tapa Manfrom to their current location, there has not been much development in the area. Nana Okoforebua was speaking at the Tutina Festival at Tapa Manfrom in the OT region. Tutina, literally, relocation or resettlement is a festival celebrated by the people of Tapa Manfrom in the Biakuye district in the Uti region, Akanim, Ode, and Brewaniasi were the towns relocated as part of the construction of the Akosombo Dam some 60 years ago. Dilapidated buildings and dusty roads are current characteristics of the community. According to the people, they feel neglected over the years as their condition of living deteriorates. They argue their farmlands have been lost due to the relocation. Nana Ntim Jakari IV is the Odehini of Tapa Manfrom. We used to have cocoa farms and homes here before the flooding came. The floods took our building, our homes and all that we had. Most of the family members of our day became very miserable and died as a result of that. We were not fishermen, so all the benefits went to those who came to resettle here after we left. We are appealing to the authorities to come to our aid as our condition is deteriorating. The farmlands we inherited are also bad due to the family activities that went on before it was given to us. Speaking at the Debar of Chiefs and People in the Tapaman area, the Paramount Chief, who is also the Vice President of the Oti Regional House of Chiefs, Nana Okofurubo Kwame Asante II, says VRA must consider adding his people to the list of scholarship beneficiaries. Yeah. Scholarship scheme I wish we had a VRA representative here. They used to have a scholarship for brilliant but needy students. But if you check the list, the Paman is not part of the list. Maybe I did not check well, but I want the message to go to them that the Paman is not part of the list. Since the relocation was 60 years ago, Tapa residents have not benefited till date, and I want the message to go to them. JT Regional Minister Daniel Machato, who graced the occasion, lauded the people for their resilience over the years. As we gather to commemorate the milestone of our 60th anniversary, let us once again rally together in the same spirit, with the same purpose. Central to this occasion is a noble endeavor that beckons us all, the revitalization of the former Tapaman Senior High Block into a cutting-edge community library, STEM and state-of-the-art computer laboratory, this transformation holds the promise of enriching not only our own lives, but also those of generations to come. Nana Okufurubo appealed to the minister to consider working on the deplorable Tapabutuasen market route and 
other adjoining roads in the area. Peter Sun for Joy News. From the OT region, let's now go to the Ashanti region, where the regional directorate of the Ghana Health Service has taken free delivery of anti-malarial medication and other essential medicines from Bless GVS Pharma. The anti-malarial medications, which come in various forms, including tablets, capsules, liquid suspensions and injections, are to be supplied to rural clinics and cheap compounds to benefit low-income households. The intervention by the global pharmaceutical company Bliss GVS Pharma is to reduce the malaria burden in Africa. Here's a report by Clinton Yabwa. Ghana is among the high burdened countries for malaria infections and recently reported a notable increase in malaria cases. Ashanti region is among the three regions with the highest malaria prevalence in pregnancy. Bliss GVS Pharma, a global pharmaceutical company recognizing this, has made a significant contribution to effort of Ghana Health Services and other stakeholders in the fight against malaria. Bliss GVS Pharma Ghana and the Act for Africa, an initiative towards a malaria free continent, has donated about 28 cartons of anti-malaria drugs, antibiotics and essential drugs to the Ashanti Regional Health Directorate. The drugs will help reduce morbidity and mortality caused by malaria infections in rural areas. Deputy Administrator at the Regional Health Directorate, Michael Asari Bidiako, says the drugs will aid vulnerable and deprived demographics who are susceptible to malaria infections. These malaria medicines will go a long way to support the indigents at the community level, where most of the people who are there are poor. You go into the, the health centers and the chips, where the most vulnerable are, especially the pregnant women and children. So it will go a long way to support the healthcare delivery in the system. Um, and the GOG, the compensation takes a chunk of the GOG funds. So we are supported by health partners. But the corporate organizations like Blaze GVS, if they come on board to support us with medicines, it will go a long way to, so, to, to support the system. The contribution of Bliss GVS Pharma with the anti missing based combination therapy, including Lunat, P. Alexin, for the treatment of uncomplicated malaria, will help improve the availability and accessibility of anti-malaria drugs in Ashanti and other selected regions. The gesture, which is in its fourth year, is to commemorate World Malaria Day yearly. Pharmacist at the Bliss GV Pharma, Bismarck Amponsa, says the assistance is part of the company's corporate social responsibility and commitment to improving health care in Ghana. Our major target is those in the rural areas, at the district level, community level, and in our villages who are mostly deprived of quality health care. If you look at the scope of people who are affected by malaria every year, it's quite a huge number. And because of that, people end up losing their lives. We have millions of people losing their lives every year from malaria infestation, including children, mothers, pregnant women, the old men and old women. And as part of our corporate social responsibility, our country head, Mr. Vivek Patel, together with our general CEO, Mr. Gargan Shama, have taken it upon themselves to donate anti-malaria medications, amongst other drugs, to the regional health directorate, various regional health directorates every year. Reporting for joining us, my name is Clinton Yabwa. And it's a wrap for the AM News. Up next is the News Review. Please stay with us for that. Tutina, literally, relocation or resettlement is a festival. <laughs> Welcome back on the AM show. Time now for us to get into the news review. Mary Poppins and uh, yours truly will be doing this shortly. Uh, but right before we get into it, let's acknowledge our sponsors, those who help us bring you this every weekday morning. I'm talking about none other than Endpoint Homeopathic um, Clinic. Now, they're offering you, if you're a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free. 
You know where to go. But if you don't, let me remind you. Here in Accra, Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard. That's where they can be located. In Kumasi, Kronom Abwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takra DNIG State. There's Tema Community 22. There's Techiman Hanswa and Siaman Zima. Their call lines 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 3821. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. Before I bring in our guests, I'm going to rant for about a minute, though my blunt thoughts are later. Mr. President, the governing New Patriotic Party, Bonnebeng and Adana Fayem. Yesterday, we had the national dialogue on energy and everything in between. I slept in darkness. I had my bath twice last night. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people um, who suffers, one of those. I suffer from what you would call hyperhidrosis. I perspire a lot. I sweat a lot, even on the scalp of my head. It is irritable when there's no power. I had to have, in fact, I spent a long time on a huge balcony just trying to cool down. Still, the mosquitoes were also feasting on me there. So I had to come inside, and it was simply unbearable. Why? I had to do gymnastics to get my shirt ironed this morning. And when I came to work, guess what? I heard the brrrr meaning, Charlie. <laughs> they do the thing for here, too. Hey! And when you mention it, I'm sorry, you'll have some asinine personalities come and tell you there is no doom so. So this one, you'll be waiting. You'll be waiting. You know, eh? Ajabrao, I'm on air. I'm on TV. But I think sometimes we ought to get really radical with some of the stupidity going on in our country. Because when something goes on and you can't even look us in the face and tell us the truth, whether it is generational problem, whether it is gas that you cannot purchase, whether it's a financial problem, whether it is trans transformers or transmitters or whatever it is, what is the reality of the ordinary man out there? God have mercy on Ghana. Sweetie Abochi, did you have light? Not, uh, well, when I got home late last yesterday, there was no light. It came on around 7 p.m. So from 7 p.m. I had light. Um, I couldn't do anything when I got home because my phones were off. My laptop was dry. But Ben, I feel your pain. I, I'm Maybe getting I, sick yeah, and yeah, yeah, tired yeah. of this, It honestly. shall be well. <laughs> you, you, I mean, there's no, a lot of stuff about privatization. In civilized so democracies, perhaps, they make things well. Here, we like to do, oh, ebe ye ye, ebe ye ye ti yeah. It's like Manifest said, debi debi ebe ye ye, debi debi ebe ye ye. And so debi debi beba da bain. I feel your pain. We have everything in this country. Yesterday I was having a discussion with somebody and the flight of, you know, professionals. And, and this person had gone into a certain private, j just before we go to our guest, a certain private university because of creative thinking and the rest, because the father felt, oh, we need more of that and we should stay in the country. But I tell you, if you really want to impact not just you and your family, your nucleus, but many people, it probably makes sense to go travel to other parts of the world, make some good money, come and invest that money in Ghana. That, that I agree with. Then you are helping your family when you are there, the remittances. Ghana thrives on that. <sighs> and you are also able to set up something here and create jobs for, without that, look, me, the skill set I have, even with my linguistic tool, tool, tool set, I mean, that would have been, here everything is like, please bring in our guest. <laughs> Right. That was a, a good note to start. So did you say? Ben, breathe. Eh? Everything will be fine. Today, the national youth organizer of the governing New Patriotic Party, Salam Mustafa, is our guest for the news review segment. Mustafa Salam, welcome to the program. How are you feeling this morning? I think you have to unmute. Um, thank you. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if you, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. So I don't know if you want to comment on anything, maybe following in Ben's 
rant about this power issue or any other topical issue that you'd like to respond to. Let's do that in just like 30 seconds and then we get into the newspapers. Uh, absolutely. First and foremost, uh, let me say good morning to you um, and your viewers uh, across the world. Um, I can understand the frustration. I don't think that there's any way to justify mm. me as a Ghanaian living in this country. When I also get home and I don't have light, I feel the same way. So I can understand the, 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 the frustration. I have engaged severally the authorities trying to understand what's going on because on the ground, a lot of these things uh, come up and uh, amply I uh, have the assurances of the highest offices that a lot uh, is being done behind the scenes to rectify the situation. It is not just for electoral gains, but for every thriving economy, energy is very, very crucial. And I think that for a party that is center, uh, uh, that's right of center, we are more business inclined. And therefore, we understand the ramifications of unstable power. So I can understand the frustrations of my, my, my friends, my contemporaries, and everybody mm -hmm. else in the country. But I am quite uh, convicted that this matter will also be dealt with, like we have dealt with so many of the challenges that uh, we have faced uh, as a nation over a period of time. Right. Thank you for that. It's just taking a while. It's taking too long for us to just deal with this thing I, I head on. I can understand that. Yeah. It is very, very discomforting. Mm. I can absolutely, absolutely understand that. It is very, very discomforting. Um, regardless of who you are, I mean, babies, elderly, you know, young people, the reaction is the same, you okay. know. So um, I, I feel it, and uh, I can tell you that I uh, every time empathize with everybody else, hmm. you know, feeling the same way. <laughs> For okay. look in my in my area, I, I don't have a chance set in my in my in my home, um, and when the, the light goes off, and I'm standing outside. I, I see my my neighbors as well. And I mean, I can feel the same way they feel. And I'm sure that so many other people in higher places also, you know, uh, take the same position that I have, right. you know, not to have a genset. Right. And they feel the same way that we all feel. Okay, let's get into the newspapers. I just like to stay optimistic, but... Uh... Let's see how long that I'm always lasts. An optimist. So in the, I'm always an optimist. Yeah, it's okay. Let's get into the newspapers. Let's start with the Daily Graphic newspaper. On the front page, the headlines are new train hmm, crashes. <laughs> Pineapple has potential. Pay attention to the crop. That is a legal practitioner in treating government. $300 million cashier's mining dispute. Laws of Ghana must apply. That is International Arbitration Tribunal rules. Asokwa Industrial Hub of Kumase. Um, let's start with the story of the $300 million cashier's mining dispute. The story reads, the permanent courts of arbitration in The Hague, Netherlands, has ruled that the loss of Ghana shall apply to an international arbitration instituted by Australian mining company, Cashier's Mining Company, against government of Ghana. Cashier's is seeking about $300 million in damages with a claim that the government of Ghana breached its contractual obligations and the laws of the country by not reviewing its prospecting license to enable it to engage in mining in the country. Ruling on the preliminary issues, the tribunal held that the seat of the international arbitration ought to be um, Accra, Ghana, and not London, the United Kingdom, as argued by Cassius Mining. Do you want, I want to do any quick reactions to this story before I come back to, to Benjamin? Yes, yes. I mean, um, Ghana is a sovereign state, and our resources belong to the state of Ghana in trust by government on behalf for the people. Its usage, its expectation must be to the benefit of Ghanaians. And I've said time without number that how we have um, used our extractive resources, for example, over the last um, 100 years or so, 
hasn't really inured to the benefit of 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 of, of Ghana. And it is about time that we developed our own capacity, have our, have the balls to take on exploitative entities who want to take us for granted. And I take this nationalistic position on every other sector, that if there is a way we can nationalize our resources, let's do it. Almost every country is doing so. When you go to Australia, you know, South Africa and other countries, um, they, 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 they try to nationalize their uh, especially extractive resources because really that is the God-given gift to, to the nation to use to develop. So over the years, how we have treated our extractive uh, 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 resources really, really leaves much to be desired. And I'm happy that some of these things, we have had the balls to, you know, uh, stand up to, uh, if you like, in quotes, some bullies who think that we are just a third world country, we can ravage, you know, over them and, and exploit them. The, the days of exploitation is over. One lesson that COVID has really, really taught all of us as as as, as a universe is that mm. every country is independent. In fact, has the potential to be independent because when COVID hit, we we're now producing our own nose mask. We're now producing our own, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, 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 the sanitizers, uh. you know, and other essentials. In fact, even drugs. Today, some of our big uh, pharmaceuticals are producing right here in Ghana. So it's, it's a big boost for us. And I think that we should right. continue on this path and we'll make progress as a nation. Okay. Then. Shall we get into it? <laughs> I, I hope you, for I you hope to you... do the, the story about yeah. the trains. Okay, then you get into that. that. But yeah. I just want to add that, um, Godfrey, the Attorney General is the one leading this, and he's objecting to their claim, saying that if anything, the arbitration should be held here in Accra, Ghana, and not in the UK. Those are just some details of the story. Well, I mean, we followed to... that. Let's just hope that yeah. we're able to um, triumph uh, the full haul of yeah. that and, and move the country forward. Right. So new train crashes. That's a very interesting one. And when I saw the picture, I saw a car. Uh, let me get into the story first. So the new train um, procured to operate commercial. The print here is not as clear as uh, the train collided with a stationary where a section of the tracks described as. OK, I don't I can read it. it the print is not um, very detailed. But we know the story about the new trains that I think was a trial run. And there was a tractor that had been parked across the railway. And so the train what, didn't see it and just crashed into it? Well, I guess it, it could be the system it is operating with, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the case may be. But my question is, you know, in this country, eh, we are hopelessly inefficient and ineffective. What sort of training? It's a test run. Mm. Had those who were in the train had? Um, is it just a transition from those who were running the older, you know, mm. um, trains mm. that were? There must have been some preparation, but what? To what extent were they prepared for this? And how, for the life of me, <laughs> you are conducting a test run, mm. and there is a tractor park park across over. across. <clears throat> some part of the stretch. This country, I mean, we talk about incompetence, but some things happen. And you know, if you go into this, value for money, trace it down. Poland, getting these into the system, so-called. Waste. It's fine. We've brought them into the country. What will benefit from in the country too? We are so inefficient that we go and let it crash. And now, who is going to bear the cost of whatever work may be done on it? You and the I, ordinary taxpayer. taxpayer. You the incompetence in this country <laughs> stinks to the high heavens. That's all I'm saying. Mustafa Salam. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh. I will really deviate a little bit. Um, yes, it can. I, I cannot speak for the railway authority. I wasn't there. Um, I'm on tour in the Ashanti region. I 
got somewhere around Ejra when I started getting um, uh, images through WhatsApp and from other you know groups. I started reading uh, what had happened. Then later on, I think I went on social media and got a full detail. Subsequently, I have seen uh, releases from um, the railway authority. I think mm. the ministry as well, as well as the police. And if you um, read the accounts, I have, also, I have also seen videos. There are videos on social media. Um, Kofi TV posted um, a video post the the, the accident. Mm. Why I, you know, deviate a little bit from my friend's narrative is that yes, we may have expected maybe the railway authority to um, maybe double check their tracks. What if they did, like I'm saying, we're all not there. What if they did and were sure that the, the tracks were, 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 you know, uh, uh, good to go? If you saw what happened, it was a Kia track, not a tractor. It was a Kia track. That was packed right across the track. So the person came horizontally, you know, and, and, and packed, in fact, vertically and packed on the horizontal track and packed huh. in the middle, got down and went away. Hmm. So you can see that it was complete, you know, act of, you know, sabotage. It was quite deliberate. Salam, this Mustafa. One, Salam, uh, Mustafa. Hold, 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 yes. hold, hold for me. Hold for me. Hold, hold, for me. hold for me. An act of sabotage. It could be. It could be it an could act be. of sabotage, right? It could it be. It could be. So the driver didn't see it. What were their faults with the train? Were there faults with no. the training? Hold on, hold on, hold on. You said you were not there. Hold on. Were there faults with the train? Were there faults with the training the drivers had been given? Mind you, these are a different set of trains. No, no two trains are exactly the same, even when they are coming from the True. same manufacturer. And you are telling True. me that we're going to use a stretch. We knew that was the stretch the train would use. And we couldn't clear the entirety of the stretch to the point where the train would move from point A to point B. We couldn't do that. And That's the explanation is sabotage. Saying, myself and you were, were myself I mean, what kind of thinking is this? I'm coming. I'm coming. Hold on. Myself and you were not there. If the railway authority checked their track and it was cleared, and in between, if the person deliberately, and the word is deliberate, came and packed the Kia track. It's a Kia track, not a tractor. So it beats my imagination why a very sane person with reason would try to cross a railway track. You should be and asking yourself, between, Salam Mustafa, you should be asking yourself, we've not had a rail system running. That's the reality. Yes. I have seen, there are some places here in Accra where sometimes you would have, for example, the Jowulu area. You know yes. there's a rail. Yes. When you go to yes. airport, there's another one passing through at a point. These things are there. People know that trains don't usually pass by. It could also be that this person, for whatever reason, may have felt that, oh, and I'm, it, it, doesn't, it is not the right thing to do, but it happens. But wait, your explanation is that, so it wasn't expected that this person could come and do this. What you do, what a reasonable person does, when you know you are going to conduct a test run, you ensure that the entirety of the stretch is protected, that there is nothing crossing, especially when you're using a brand new train, you know you are test driving, Anything could happen, and you've invested taxpayers' money in that. Does that not make sense to you, Salam Mustafa? Does that not make sense to you? Well, it, it we, makes sense to me, mm. but you are also being definite. And I'm saying that myself and you were not there. If the railway authority cleared their tracks and in between, and the word again is deliberate, somebody goes to pack on the way, there's no way they would know. I have seen pictures. If you saw the first picture that came out, clearly the driver of the train, upon seeing, I think he negotiated a curve, and upon appearing from the curve, saw that the Kia track was packed. So, I mean, we know that it takes time for these locomotives to, you know, uh, uh, get 
their brakes fully you know deployed and and stop at an instance i've seen so many uh, documentaries of uh, trail uh, train derailments and so on and so forth so clearly if they negotiated a curve and came out and noticed that something was 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 in between you know uh, uh, the, the tracks and you know uh, it took the, the train some time to stop it is difficult to understand the motive of the person who packed and that is why we should wait for the police to finish with the investigation i understand that we've waited the police have arrested we've, we've been waiting the that's what happens that's what happens in this country we wait for investigations this is a very and nothing serious happens matter. and then we are waiting and then we are waiting but you know let, we we just have to move on because you're, you're, you're right you're, it's a very serious matter it's a very serious matter of it's incompetence a very serious matter. it's a very serious Millions matter of, of whatever of it could be sabotage but it's also a very serious days. matter of incompetence yes. You, you, you can't tell me that if you were in private it, it, enterprise, if you well, were a it, private it is, investor, it is okay to demand Salam, if you were a private investor, right. would you allow this to yes. happen? If you were a private it, investor, okay if that were demand. your trade, personal trade, would you not well, ensure that every let, let's, day of let's, the stretch let's move on. had been protected? Let's move that's on. what we should yeah, ask. That's what I'm the saying. Very reason. If, I'm, if I'm going out with my car, probably I'll check and see if my brakes are okay, my uh, water level is okay, my oil level is okay. But in between, when I leave and I'm driving, I may not have control of external things that happen outside the car. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm saying that the police is investigating the matter. The person has been arrested. Let's understand the motive first. Let's understand the circumstances under which the car was parked right in the path of the train. Then we can make a conclusive determination whether it was a, a matter of right, thank you. That's, 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 we've heard, we've heard we yeah. Let's just stories. get into the, the yeah. rest of the newspapers mm. because Anything we just wait like for, for, for that. Yes, um, Kingston appointed Black Stars uh, Starlet head coach. GFA boss calls for prioritization of youth development. Um, Gusa applauds Yabua others for African Games. Um, hmm. Koforidua Prisons Health Centre receives support from some ASA savings. Still on the daily graphic, um, just doing some more quick headlines, and then we move on to the Ghanaian Times. U.S. announces new sanctions on Iran after missile attack, and Burkina Faso expels three. What's that story? Burkina Faso expels three French diplomats. All that in the daily graphic. So pick a copy for yourself and get into the stories. Now on the Ghanaian Times newspaper on the front page, election alert. Cybersecurity Authority engages tech providers to counter misinformation powered by AI. 30% um, media outlets collapse due to financial constraints. That's according to the Minister uh, Fatima Abubakar. 609 die in road crashes first quarter of 2024. Mr. David Osafwa saying that. Ghana wins preliminary ruling in Cassius Mining case. That is the $300 million international arbitration led by Godfrey Daming. Uh, OSP files fresh charges against former PPA boss. And Mustafa, you can let me know which of these stories you want to react to quickly, and then we get into the story, and then we can move on to other papers. Election alert, cybersecurity authority engages tech providers to counter misinformation powered by AI. I must have been born with a piece of charcoal in my hand. I think this is just an editorial. Any of these stories you want us to get into so that we can do that quickly before we yes, go on? Yes, this... Uh, uh, disinformation matter. Right. It, it's a very serious matter. Okay. Just hold for me. Let me bring that... our audience up to speed. So it reads, the Cybersecurity Authority has cautioned the public to be wary of election misinformation and disinformation targeted at flowing this year's general elections. Director General of the CSA, Dr. Albert Entry Bosiako, said the authority was anticipating the deployment of disinformation and misinformation um, campaigns powered by artificial intelligence, especially on social media, to influence the decision of voters. In this regard, he noted that the CSA was engaging social media platforms, including Facebook and X, formerly known as Twitter, to roll out mechanisms to detect and prevent them from going viral. First of all, okay, you let me get your reactions from this and then we can move on. Yes, this disinformation matter is a very serious matter. You know, I'm sure you remember that in the United States, um, there was this probe on Russia uh, meddling with American elections. The charge was that they did not physically get involved 
in manipulating the results, but the level of misinformation and disinformation was quite noticeable and led to uh, uh, the, the outcome of the results as the, the, the Congress might have believed. So it is very, very important that we place a lot of attention on disinformation. Look, when you go on social media, some of the things that are crafted, you know, and circulated, it's quite frightening. And for me, for um, us as a people, our sociocultural cohesion, the security of our state, if we are not cautious and deal with disinformation, one day will be there and someone will create will create a very big problem for us because we we will create something and throw into the system that is completely false and might ignite a certain fire that we have absolutely no control over so i think that it is crucial that we really deal with this information and you see faceless persons i i, I know situations there's this precarious situation in the upper East region where someone uh, they believe lives across the border does odious all the time, inciting, making tribal, you know, uh, uh, inciting, you know, audio tapes and throwing them across into uh, 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 the border in Ghana around the Boku area and finding ethnic conflict there. So the, the the cyber security you know agency all of these things we, we we need to really really you know find a way to uh have some graphs over it look some months back i was there and i started getting a lot of uh, uh calls and whatsapp messages mm. that and I, I was sent an artwork of something purportedly i had said which i never said uh right that uh, 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 Christians had dominated over Muslims for a very long time, and uh, it was time Muslims rose up. And also, you know, I, I can't remember the exact context, of, but it was false. I never said that anywhere. All right, but it was hanged on me. Salam, we need and to we need to get into it. other papers now. <laughs> yes. your, your point is made. Thank you, Benjamin. Well, let's quickly get into other papers. Daily Guide newspaper, the Cassius case is there. Um, Ghana's debt surged under NDC. Uh, Dr. Bano says so. Uh, there's Edward Jiri, Zango chiefs pledge allegiance to Achehene. And Otumfo fights for private uh, sector. Let me quickly get into two of those stories. Page three, and it says, Policy think tank Dankwa Institute has stated that the ruling New Patriotic Party record in governance has always resulted in superior debt management than the opposition NDC. According to the Institute, Ghana's debt climbed to $29.2 billion between 2009 and 2016, representing 261.83% growth in total public debt stock under the NDC, greatly exceeding the debt stock recorded under the MPP administration. This kind of talk is so loose that sometimes I don't even want to get into it. So let's assume all these facts and figures. Of course, the Dankwa Institute is aligned. So let me also speak to it from that angle because they are aligned. What has been the debt stock under the MPP? How much have we added on? And if someone did the wrong thing, please, I'm making a point, Salam. If someone did the wrong thing, does it make sense yeah. to come and do the same thing? I'm putting this question out there to Ghanaians, not necessarily uh, you, but you can, you can respond to it. Then I'll go to page. I, I am a bit upset this morning, I admit. Especially I, I, because I of the power I, I outage this, and everything. This morning I am up. upset and I am, I am upset at the sheer stupidity that we exhibit in different facets of our national life. And yet, because of partisanship, we allow it to go on because I am NDC, me NDC me, I am MPP, me MPP me. It's nonsensical. The country is sinking. How long will we keep on doing these things? How long? I'll do the other story and then you can react uh, to it. OSP files new charges against ex-PPA boss. The Office of the Special Prosecutor has filed a new charge sheet against the dismissed former Chief Executive Officer of the Public Procurement Authority, Ejenim Watting Ejay, who was accused of using public office for profit. And it goes on with the new charge sheet. We all know the story. Only in this country, certain things happen. 
nothing to show. If you have quick reactions, we have two minutes to go. Quick reaction, then I'll go to the Find a Newspaper and wrap there. Salam. Yeah, Ben, um, I can understand that you are upset this morning. Um, but please, uh, have the, the, the best of assurances that we are not uh, a, a nation, in, in a banana nation. I'm sure we'll get our acts right. On the issue of um, the OSP um, and uh, Ajanin, uh, AJ, I think that uh, it is in the right direction. For me, I, I would never stop any case that bothers on uh, corruption. Uh, just a few days ago, I think sometime this week, there was this mass law case, right, you know, uh, uh, in the direction that we want. If the OSP, the Attorney General can also, you know, pursue this matter to its logical conclusion, it should be done. Regardless of who you are, nobody's ox is God. Corruption is corruption. It should be fought as far as hard as it can. I say all the time that these countries that have made progress, that, you know, have seen you know, leapfrogging from a third world to now, you know, a developed, you know, country. They didn't do so by accident. It's by dint of hard work, mm. which we can do. We have the resources, we have the manpower, we have the ability to. Some of these things are, are, are the things, you know, really stopping us. Uh, uh, public officers being corrupt, okay. uh, 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 not putting money in the right uh, uh, investments and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, we are fully behind the system to pursue some of these cases and get to its logical conclusion. It all should right. serve as a deterrent to all of us who are in, in the public space that when you are put in positions of trust, authority, you don't use it for your personal gain, but rather to the gain of, 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 of the entire nation for the, for the, for the people. Thank because you, Salam. We, we really have to go. Are in office to do. Um, the, the new Finder newspaper, motorcycles killed 931 out of 2,276 road crash fatalities in 2023. So that's almost 1,000. It means 1,276 from all others and motorcycles alone killing 931. Uh, that's all I will do from the papers I have. Any, no, anything that's else? It. That's really Final words, uh, Salam Mustafa, Mustafa. We have 30 seconds to go. Our time is practically up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity this morning to spend time with with you uh, on this very big platform. But I can appreciate the uh, anger this morning. It's not just you. And I am as passionate as you are uh, about a lot of the things that happen in our nation. I said time without number. I don't hold the citizenship or even permanent, permanent residence of any other country than Ghana. And I don't have any intentions of leaving any other country than Ghana. So I want the very best for this country. I want a country that thrives, a country that opens opportunities for its people, a country that is working. And that is why I believe in leadership. The countries that we have seen doing well, it is not by accident. Angels didn't come down to do that for these countries. Human beings did and did so by building systems. We should look for leaders that build systems. It's systems that will let us get the kind of results that we want. And I'm sure that uh, with uh, 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 the right leader in place, we are going to you know, be able to Thank make you, Salam, uh, a, a serious progress. And I believe that Dr. Baumia is the right uh, leader for the next chapter. We just Salam talked about Mustafa, politicizing, politicizing. of the governing uh, new patriotic party. He joined uh, the You guys have a nice day. I appreciate it. Morning. Have a nice day. You do say. Uh, the title of my blunt thoughts, which I'll be sharing you, with you right up next uh, after sports, um, or that is maybe before sports, the privatization conundrum, things to consider. The privatization conundrum, things to uh, consider. You want to stay for that. But before we go, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us bring you this segment. They are offering prostate screening for free if you're a man, fertility screening for free if you're a woman. Reach out to them at any of their branches. And uh, here in Accra, it's Pentex opposite the Shell Sign Board, Kumasi Kronomo Abwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takra Dianaji State, Tema Committee 22, Tichiman Hansu and Their call lines 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. We'll be right back.
I needed to take that breath. Yeah, because this morning I am visibly upset. Not just because I slept without light throughout the night, but because of everything going on. And the way, the more I think about Ghana and where we are and when we can ever catch up with the rest of the world, if we will ever catch up. And don't even think US, Canada and the rest. Right here, other countries in Africa. It just makes me think. The Rwandas, the South Africans, the Egypts, even Nigeria on some fronts. But let me give you my title for my blunt thoughts today. The privatization conundrum, things to consider. The privatization conundrum, things to consider. And some of the things I want us to consider are what I'm going to be sharing with you up next before I get to the slides. Now, between the years uh, 1987 and uh, 1999, Ghana's privatization program generated revenue for the government note, equivalent to about 14% of GDP from a practically dead public sector, which had been previously dependent on state subventions and only succeeded in fulfilling key roles in easing the fiscal crisis and in fostering the structural adjustment program. But mind you, that was because public enterprise at that point was dead in the water. Now, the big question remained, though, whether the privatization process would help the growth of Ghana's economy and help maximize political gain. Now, on, that is privatization on one end. How about nationalization? It just refers simply to a common occurrence in developing countries, mostly, uh, because governments worldwide play an integral role in preserving and advancing their economies. And this is in a, a bid to protect citizens and allow for the highest possible standard of living. Now, part of this also involves working with the private sector. You know, there are joint ventures and providing assistance in times of need. So, for example, during times of economic unrest, such as we are facing now, or such as could happen in a war or, or financial hardship, the government may help struggling businesses or industries and prevent significant economic impact. Now, this is the fundamental understanding of nationalization. Um, a government can, however, implement this process for other reasons, for example, to prevent monopolies or oligopolies, to seize control of profit or strategically align profit for social purposes, and pay attention to that, social purposes, to provide stability. Uh, it could also be a form of punishment or protecting the rights of workers at ad infinitum, ad nauseum. There could be so many uh, reasons uh, these could be done. But in our particular context, when the Asantehene talks about privatization, I respectfully disagree. And this is because when you look at where we find ourselves as a country, even the local elements that will come into privatization are highly politically skewed. Whichever party is in power, if the NDC is in power, it will be politically skewed. If the MPP is in power, it will be politically skewed. That's the problem. Look at Ejapa. Look even at the PDS deal and some things that were in there. It just tells you that even when he talks about privatizing locally, there are so many loopholes. It's like a landmine, a landmine field. Those are the problems inherent. And if we go outside our borders, even worse. But let me come now to the slides because I'll paint a picture there about what exactly the pitfalls are. Of course, we know of the ECG, PURC, back and forth. And then we can debate the matters. Now, in terms of our national security commodities, I've been talking about this throughout this week. A lot of people don't pay attention to it, but our telco system is so vulnerable. The telcos, the phones you use, the chip, the data, the, the bundling and everything. Imagine if for some reason one of these entities, and we know, the quota they hold, just decided, okay, Ghana is adopting this posturing and we are, our ownership is from here, here, here. So we're going to truncate services for a while, even when there was a legitimate issue and internet, there were internet downfalls and all of that recently, cable cuts, fiber optic cuts. Look at how we suffered. We don't have the tools of our economy in our hands. They are in other people's hands which means as every country that has sentient thinking leadership, we should be concerned. Because someday, someday, if anything were to happen in any of these, we could find ourselves literally begging in our own country. Telcos, it's a huge problem. It's only recently that we claim we acquired 80. Even then, <laughs> there are questions to answer. 
As for electricity and water, they are the basic utilities, and we know of them. We have tried in the past some of these, Aquavitans, Rand, and everything with water, PDS, with electricity. Haven't we learned enough? And at what point will we sit up and say, you know what? These are crucial to our national life. So let's get it right. But because of our tomfoolery, we keep getting it wrong, and we may actually get to the point where privatization may be the only option, though I don't think we are there yet. But let's go to the next slide. What did the Asante Hene say? Move government entities like the VRA to the private sector for better profits. Invest in Gridco with diverse, qualified teams. Transition electricity company to private ownership for improved uh, service. But, Otekokoso, we have actually tried this electricity thing before. You're fully aware. And it was tainted with corruption from the NDC to the MPP, both of them. It was tainted because what some people wanted and the renegotiations and all of that, let's not even lie. The very people at the top wanted to be the beneficiary owners in different ways. That will not help us. Invest in Gridco with diverse qualified teams. I agree. I agree with that. But why have we not done it up to this point? Why, why, why do we do it piecemeal? Move government entities like the VRA to the private sector for better profit. They may, when we privatize, make more profit. But what would that mean in terms of the ripple effect of cost on the ordinary Ghanaian? That's what we ought to contemplate. Next slide. Now, a lesson from the past, right? Parliament, and apologies for not having the P here, approved an agreement between the government and a consortium led by the Manila Electricity Company on July the 24th, 2018. The government claimed the insurance documents submitted by PDS were tainted by fraud, that is when the MPP took over, leading to the suspension of the official transfer a year later. Now a delegation was later sent to Qatar to investigate the fraudulent act. Uh, next slide. But if you look at the pain of lifeline consumers and, and all of this, and we have been very intentional with what we are doing because you remember lifeline consumption even during COVID and the supposed attempts because we paid through the nose for the supposedly free electricity we got. But lifeline consumers are the most basic consumers, the poorest of the poor, who have very little and it makes no sense to overcharge them. I mean, for those using ACs and all of that, the lifeline consumer is just there. Maybe a, a light bulb and maybe a fan. That could be it. At worst, a television set. But even then, if you look at the new rates, if you have a TV set, you can only account for maybe half or a quarter of the TV set. Maybe your light bulb and, you know, your fan. And that's it. But if you look at how things have gone in kilowatt, kilowatts per hour per month, 1992, we were looking at 50 kilowatts per hour per month. In 1994, it w went up to 100. This wasn't a bad idea at all. Not bad. 100, meaning they had some room to breathe. It went down to 50 in 1998. Now we are looking at 30 in 2022. What does that mean? For the lifeline consumer, their benefits have been capped, cut to the lowest we have seen in what, 1992 to 2022, about 30 years, three decades, and it continues. How does the person down there get better? Next slide. Now, if you look again at the old versus new, consumption per month, zero to 30 kilowatt hours, we're looking at a maximum bill per month of 12 CDs and 40 uh, pesos. And you must ask yourself even, what is the minimum wage? What is the minimum wage? And people earning minimum wage, how will they survive and even be able to foot this? Right? Then you come to the increment, zero to 50 kilowatt hours, and that is the, the bracket now. 19 CDs, 26 pesos. I know people who don't even make five CDs in a day. Five CDs. What maybe you used to buy a ball of kinky. Some people don't make five CDs a day. Think about that. Next slide. Then we come to this whole conundrum, and yesterday I listened to Andre Japamesa and the others, and whether it is a war or a battle, 
whatever the case may be, between the ECG and the PURC. And of course, the ECG having 61 different bank accounts. Lord knows why. Speak to Samuel Dubik Mahama. Don't ask me. But then let's look at the breakdown. Next slide. The total number of accounts, 61. Accounts submitted to the PURC, 36. Outstanding, 25. Next slide. Now, if you look at Ghana's IMF program in context, the ECG sub-accounts had to be merged into a single collection account, which they have not met. The account was to be audited every quarter. And the final report of the July to September 2023 audit was to be published by the end of February 2024. These are Article 4 requirements which have not been met, largely. Next slide. But then you get to this final place. This is the final place uh, port of call. Why some of us are very concerned whether local privatization, and we've seen some of that as well. Let's not forget. And foreign privatization. The levers of our economy largely are in the hands of foreigners. When you think supermarkets, let me just do, I'll not mention brands, think supermarkets. You're thinking of the Lebanese, the Indians, and the rest. You know exactly which entities I'm pointing to. Which one of them? I don't know. There's one that comes to mind, but even that is on the downturn. You're thinking supermarkets. They're in the hands of foreigners. You're thinking furniture. There's more of a, a balance in there. But now, if you look at the innovation, a lot of them are foreign. That is why the cost. I don't know the net last time you checked the cost of furniture out there. And th even those made locally cost an arm and a leg. Also because of poor policies that allow the importation of these so that when the local person is producing, it's at, at an exorbitant rate. Everywhere in the service sector you want to look, it's foreigners dominating. I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but with the porousness of our laws and corruption, it's a deadly cocktail. Because you know who suffers in the end? We do. You and I. We suffer in the end. And it makes no sense. And that is why we should tread extremely cautiously with this privatization agenda. Because we've seen it before. And with the crop of leaders we have, misleaders as I call them, self-seeking, self-aggrandizing, wicked people we have. I'm not saying all of them, but you know that we shouldn't be where we are as a country now. With this crop of people, how? Can we get these things right? Now, my last slide. Privatized to some extent, ECG, VRA, Gridco, right? You'll be looking at more profit inclination. It is a natural process of the capitalist systems when you privatize. Mind you, you will also find that in the developed world, even in China, while it may have its own um, socialist tendencies, over the decades, it has also had a capitalist twist to it. That is why the Alibabas and the rest would, would come to the fore because of what it sees in there. But what is regulation like there versus what it is here? That's where the devil is, always in the detail. Then you can expect that the cost of electricity and other services will go up. Remember what I told you about even lifeline consumers. What will that do to them? What will that do to us? Do you know how much I spend in a week on electricity? And Nema here and Amuzu. So cost of electricity likely to shoot up. That will lead to an increased cost of production. Of course, there will be poor pay for more. Uh, the poor will pay more for electricity. Increased costs of production because they'll be trying to meet certain benchmarks. And that will also bring in the cost factor. Already our finance ministry is bleeding. So they may... You transfer this, but they will not be doing it for you for free. No, unlike the orientation when we are nationalizing, focusing on, on the most vulnerable. And then, of course, the prices of goods and services will go up. Now, if you consider, I have bought spare parts for my car in recent times. You consider that fuel prices, cost of food, cost of drink, cost of transport, cost of medication, which I have to buy, cost of so many other factors we're up to our necks our eyebrows in the mud so as we discuss on these things let's be careful 
because we could end up laughing on the wrong ends of our mouths. Some people don't like what I say. When it goes for them, like it did in the past, it is okay. Now when I speak about the reality of things happening, it is not okay. But me, me hmm? It is what it is. We can pretend or we can decide to move this country forward. It is your call and mine. God bless Ghana and make her great and strong. These are my blunt thoughts shared with you, raw, hot, unedited, undiluted. Stay with us for the rest of our programming. The stability of the Fourth Republic depends heavily on your resolve to maintain the sanctity of your profession and your independence as the Fourth Estate. If I may say so, as we celebrate this landmark anniversary, let it be a call to all journalists to rise to the occasion, to uphold the values that have defined your noble profession, and to hopefully continue to be the beacon of hope and accountability our nation needs. Your association's inspection, inception, came at a very pivotal time, pivotal time as Ghana stood on the verge of defining its future, breaking free from colonial domination. Your association, predating even our nation's independence, became the crucible within which the fervent hopes and aspirations of a people were nurtured and expressed. Even before the formation of your association, nationalists like J.B. Dankwa, Kwame Nkrumah, Kofi Bacha, Eric Heyman, Kofi Bakun, T.D. Bafo, Kofi Bedu, amongst others, stood at the vanguard of the struggle, wielding the might of the pen and the unwavering spirit of truth as they used their voices for advocacy. Dreams of a liberated and thriving Ghana expressed through purposeful writing and careful dissemination on the pain of punishment. These were patriots, men who were inspired and motivated by the ideals of a free and prosperous nation. Mr. Chairman, today as we traverse the sands of time and reminisce the jubilation of independence through the trials of military regimes, which are sometimes rancorous, other times harmonious ebb and flow of democracy. We find the essence of journalism tested and exalted. The courage, the sacrifice, the unwavering commitment of your members have not only chronicled our nation's history, but they have been instrumental in shaping its discourse. Insightful and courageous citizens like Cameron Dodu, PAV, PAV Ansa, Kweku Bakon, Bessie Pratt, Kwame Karikari, Kujo Yanka, Nagri, Elvis Aye, Sam Ade Clark, Cabral Ble Amihir, Elizabeth Ohine, Heron Atta, Kwame Amamo, Mike Egan, Vada Kranti Asante, Giftia Feni Dazi, and many others have paid the way for many today. We observe a landscape altered by the winds of change. The once famous United Front of Objectivity and Patriotism appears to some fragmented by the device of partisanship and the shadows of materialism. The noble quest for truth now competes with the allure of political patronage and its material rewards, a phenomenon which, if I may say so, threatens the sanctity of your independence, the fourth estate. Yet, this is the period when the vigilance of the fourth estate is most needed. As we stand on the precipice of yet another electoral milestone, which in my view is the most consequential, the ethos, the echoes of past violence, the whispers of disenfranchisement looms. And I don't think anyone needs reminding that the conduct of the electoral exercise together with its outcome is so important 
that the nation cannot afford bias and unprofessional coverage offered by members of your profession. I wish, Mr. Chairman, I could be more confident that the coverage will be professional, but I'm afraid I can't, given the rather unserious way in which another very important national issue, the most egregious abuse of the rights of millions whose livelihood had been designated completely by Galamsey operations has been treated by your profession. I don't know whether you are exhausted and indeed frustrated by the shameful lack of dec decisive action from the authorities to your interventions. All I know is that your association's pen, which is your weapon, has gone eerily silent on this all-important matter. I would have liked to see a more concerted and sustained action from you. Sadly, that has not been the case. Galamsey doesn't make the headlines anymore, and yet the country is experiencing the ravages of <clears throat> this terrible phenomenon every day. The alarming increase in kidney and liver diseases, the increase in children born with deformities, and the alarming infant mortality rates in the areas affected by Galamsey activities appear not to merit your sustained concern. What a shame. What a pity. As journalists, the times we live in beckon you to remember your purpose, your power, and your responsibility. Let me just say this. The price of your continued silence is too grave to fathom. Mr. Chairman, it is in this moment of reflection and anticipation that the immortal West of Ephraim Amos' composition, Yang Ara Assassini, resound with unparalleled relevance. The composition resonates today deeply. Its message of patriotism, stewardship, and unity echoes the ideals that all of us must champion. Well, that is the Chancellor of the University of uh, Cape Coast sharing his thoughts on the media and how the media must live above the board and also speak, be that voice of the people. Well, joining us for a conversation uh, this morning, we have Roland Afeo Money. He is former president of the GJA. Later, we'll also have uh, Suleimana Brahma, executive director, Media Foundation for West Africa. And also in the studio, your very own Mary Poppins. She introduced herself this morning. I knew I was going Sweetie. to say to be a Sweetie. Mary Poppins. I'm, I'm yeah. um, welcome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio. It's a pleasure. Mm. Uh, just, just to go off the top right before Sweetie comes in, what was your reaction when uh, Sam Jonah actually had all of this to share on the media and how crucial our role is as the fourth realm of the state mm. in these times? Um, let me first of all sprinkle a uh, status of commendation on the executive of the GJ and the planning committee for making the right choice as far as the speaker was concerned. Um, Sam is an, is an extraordinary nationalist, patriot. He doesn't dance to the tune of anybody. He analyzes issues as they are. He does not only analyze. He prefers solutions. And what we heard at that lecture was a root cause analysis of our situation and how we should rise above this situation to be the black star we are destined to be. So um, I listened with all absorbing attention and all consuming seriousness. Because uh, uh, before then, I've, I've, I've had discussion with Sam Jonah on how, you know, uh, on this issue and other issues. And he, he did assure I mean, that he was, going to, he was going to make certain statements which will capture the attention of the whole nation mm. and then ignite a conversation. I believe, and also I'm not surprised when uh, Joy FM or Joy TV Sorry that we should look at what he said. So kudos to him. Uh, Ghana loves him. Ghana cherishes him. And we need more of Sam Jonas in this country to help address our situation. And then 
get us to move forward in the right direction. Right. I like to think that the media has been very critical in the progress of our democracy, even in our development as a country, from colonial, colonialism, uh, pre-independence struggles, even during independence, and Kuma establishing all these newspapers, Ghana yeah, News yeah, Agency, right. and all mm -hmm. that. And we are here today. I think as we grow, the role of the media is also expanding. So some of the things that he says, that um, it speaks to lack of confidence in our ability to deliver on a mandate as media, you know, to propel democracy and ensure that come these, this election 2024, we will do well to ensure transparency and all the things that we have to do. My question is, what are the gaps? I know there are obviously some issues that have happened, like the electoral violence in Nayawaso, uh, the issues of Saul, the death of some of the investigative journalists in this country. But what are the gaps that you think he's specifically speaking to that will impede the progress of the work of the media in this election year? Um, we need to cast our mind back to appreciate what the media did mm. to help Ghana to gain independence. Right. You know, um, he mentioned J.B. Dan Kwame Nkrumah and others mm. who use their permanency to advance the cause of independence. Mm. And after independence, Kwame Nkrumah used the media, again used the media, mm. to build the geopolitical entity called Ghana. GBC in particular, you know, languages, you know, Ghanaian languages, he popularized the use of Ghanaian languages mm. on national radio and television. And um, even though we, there were not, there, were, there was not much dissenting voices in the media, mm. but Kwame Kwame was so purposeful. He appreciated the power of the media. Uh, we are told that um, information and the structures which disseminate information are the most powerful weapon on it. And to quote Malcolm S, mm. journalism uh, or the media are the most powerful entity on earth. Um, sometimes we, we abuse the power we wield and the influence we peddle mm. to the extent that some journalists are, 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 are rather the problem instead of being the solution to the problem. Mm. And so we thank Sam Jonah, and he, he did emphasize on truth, the need for journalists to stick to the truth. Journalism is not the perpetration of falsehood. Journalism is the dissemination of discernible and discernible facts, discernible facts. So it's my heart bleeds any time sessions of the media peddle falsehood. Right. The motives. Ah, no, they are too dirty to me think of. Mm. We have a session of the media of a certain class of journalists who have perfected the act of twisting issues and concocting falsehoods. Okay. So, we, the, again, this raises the issue of motives, the issue of why, some people are in the media for wrong reasons. Journalism is a calling. Mm. And so we have a little of people who have not been called, but yet they are practicing journalism. To the extent that we have sessions of media which are doing well, and um, let me say with a high sense of pride that joy of most media is a symbol of excellence in journalism. Why, but this you. is a sharp mm. contrast. Mm. It's what is happening in sessions of the media. Right. In certain sessions of the media, what we see alarmingly is the degeneration of standards to the extent that journalism in those sessions have become a standardless profession, standardless profession. Right. Um, so, if, if I may just yeah. uh, chip in on that. You've mentioned two critical things. People getting in for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Mm. That is one. Yeah. Um, and maybe someday I'll share my story about how I became a media practitioner because I never even thought I would be here. I was going to use my languages, other studies for different things, work with other entities. It's, it's interesting because the rationale behind being here, I agree. And there are people you get to know and you know they are compromised. Yeah. But they are in the business. What do you do? That is one. 
But the second thing, why are all these things? Because I say on any given day, yeah. there are certain newspapers, mm -hmm. the print media, yeah. I can pick. Same story. And I can guarantee that XYZ newspaper will take it from this political angle. Yeah. Yeah. And ABC newspaper will take it from that political yeah. angle. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. I don't have to look into any crystal ball. I can, it is there. Those are there. And it boils down to the political class, media ownership, mm -hmm. and the number of those involved, either directly involved, tangentially involved, or who are related to people walking the corridors of power. Now it's even spread to um, the broadcast media, TV and radio. radio. Is that not where the real thrust of the problem is? Because in these entities, mind you, when they are recruiting you, some people even share with me, they are telling you, listen, that is one good thing I love about where I am. Because the day people start telling me to go this way or that way, back in the years when I was railing against Mahama, no one told me at my former entity, yeah. don't do this. Now that I'm railing against this administration and some wrongdoing, no one is telling me, oh, don't go here, don't go there. The CEO himself says, do what you, you, you get it, that is it. But in other places, th that is not it. So these are some of the fundamental problems we really should be looking at. Absolutely, okay. yeah. And under autocratic regimes, mm. and um, the greatest enemy of the media was officialdom, the government. Mm. We saw it under Rawlings, we saw it under, under uh, 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 military regimes. And in 1992, thank God, we had the opportunity to abandon the bullet course and embrace democracy as a civilized means of choosing mm -hmm. our, our, our leaders. And since then, there have been progress in the media space. We, we, we have the uh, latitude to, to criticize, mm -hmm. to hold to account people in positions of authority, to uh, peddle the sentient views and all that. And, but this is not to say that we are not out of the woods. We still have some challenges. And I totally agree with Ben that uh, uh, the unrestrained invasion of the media space by politicians. We have a situation where almost every MP owns a radio station in this country. Political parties have their papers, and you don't need any superfluity of intelligence to conclude that this uh, newspaper is aligned to this party or this radio station is doing the bidding of a certain political party. So the greatest enemy now, on the yesterday years, when it was military regimes, dictators, now the greatest enemy of the media now is the ownership structure, ownership. Mm. When the ownership confers power and authority on whoever owns a media system, and to the extent that owners are now dictating content, which should be the job of professionals, so, and then uh, I did it to that. Uh, certain uh, media houses, sometimes we confront them. Why would you abandon the, 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 the foundational principles of mm. journalism? But isn't it the issue of money? The media is a profit making entity. I mean, since the inception of 1992 Constitution, and we are, we are talking about press freedom, but we know that they cannot run without money. Even our elections that are supposed to be free and fair. You vote for the people who you think you make, you have some, you, you know, you start to gain something from them. So this ownership, again, it's because of money. Oh, Benjamin, how do you, do you see where I'm going with this? Well, you, you do have money a point because... Money is the fundamental reason why they would choose to tell the story the way they can tell it so that they massage the ego or whatever of the people that's putting money in their You're pockets. right, but it's also an avenue to, you know, whitewash bad money. Ah, yes. That, that is also yes. being done. Yes. Uh, and in so many other, it's something we often lose sight mm. of. It is in there. But I, I don't know what you think on the question. And maybe you might add, do you think it is high time we got more transparency in media ownership? Yeah. Because you go to certain places, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that one belongs to this person. <laughs> and you see, and some you actually go into it and realize that indeed, this person, and uh, I feel money. It takes a lot of money. To, run to buy the sort of equipment <laughs> it is a lot of money. Yeah. required. I mean, the, the, this video wall you're seeing, just one of the screens, costs 
huge sums of money. Someone's maybe 10 year, 20 year salary, just one of it. More. So, so when these people whom we have known come up with these entities, we ought to be asking, and that is why transparency is important. Who owns this and how did you come by the resources to even put this up? Um, fantastic question. Um, the um, broadcasting bill, which has been incubating for okay. decades now, attempt to resolve this issue of ownership. Mm. And um, in certain sections of the bill, it is proposed that no one individual can own more than three media systems. Okay. And guess what? The people who are kicking against this bill are media owners, the people who have, who have a chain of uh, media athletes, because they don't want their monopoly to be broken, they don't want their influence to diminish in any way. So, so here we, we are where we are because of the stiff opposition from these people who are benefiting from this uh, decay in the media. So um, I think we need to rise up again, you know, join forces to ensure that the media, uh, proposed media uh, broadcasting law comes into fruition to help sanitize the media system and ensure that journalists do justice to their professional method. Right. Um, Suleiman Ibrahim, uh, Suleiman Suleiman Ibrahim, Ibrahim, Ibrahim uh, joins us via phone. Thank you for joining the program. I'm sure you've been following the conversation so far. What are your initial thoughts on this conversation? Um, so I, I don't know when you say conversation generally well, you we, are referring right. to. We are talking, we, right. We are talking about the speech from uh, the Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Sir Jonah, Sam Jonah on the role of media leading up to election 2024, the gaps, and how we can ensure that we are discharging our duties without you know, prejudice and biases. And so far, the issue of partisan ownership of media houses, the issue of money has come up. And so that's where we've reached at this point. Well, thank you very much for having me, and good morning. Um, I think that at this stage, conversations about media professionalism media standards and, and, and the issues of ownership, money, and so on. We need to look at it from a very holistic perspective. Uh, first of all, the individuals who are practicing as journalists are Ghanaians. And so uh, whatever attitudes, whatever practices, whatever conduct that we are observing in Ghana as a totality, would certainly be reflected in what is happening in the media. It's not as though um, the people who are practicing in the media are people brought from elsewhere. They are the same people in Ghana. And so I think we, we, don't, we need to look at it from the, the general contextual issues in Ghana. And I would say that we are at a stage where in this country, we have lost patriotism. We have lost, you know, passion for the nation. People are no longer thinking about the future of this country. They are thinking about now. Everyone is interested in making money, and it, it's, it's all about making money now, making money quick. And it's not about the values of patriotism and the values of let's preserve the future. The problems start from the top, the leadership of the country, from the presidency to the vice presidency to the, 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 the people who are holding positions as ministers to director generals, directors generals, and so on and so forth. And it cascades all the way down. So I think what we've missed as a country is the fact that over the years, and maybe in the last 20 or so years, we have had leaders who basically come to power and are not interested in the future of this country. It's all about let's make money, and when we have money, we can win elections. Mm -hmm. And that is what has been happening. 
As a result, part of that would be let's establish media houses and use the media houses to perpetuate ourselves in power. The people who end up getting to work in these media houses, most of them are there, sometimes not having gone through journalism um, school or journalism training. It's all about politics. And it's actually not politics. It's about money making. It's about power and money making. And, and so for me, it's not about, yes, having the broadcasting law may help, but just like all other sectors, talk about corruption, talk about our judiciary, talk about you know, our parliament, just as it's happening everywhere, it's not a law. Because in some of the issues, on some of the issues, there are laws that could, you know, I mean, if, if, we're about, if it were about laws, maybe corruption, the way we see it, and the skills at which we are seeing it, wouldn't have been the case. It's about the individuals, we the citizens, and the extent to which we are prepared to do the right thing, the extent to which leaders are committed to preserving the future of this country the extent to which, you know, those of us in the media are willing to say, look, yes, we all have to make money to survive, but it's about doing our work right. So for me, it's a general canker that is affecting everywhere, whether religion, look at our religious leaders, whether in the Islamic sect or in the Christian sect, you have, you know, people who are basically looking for money instead of doing the work of God. It's all about money making building big churches, driving multiple cars, you know, um, imams consulting for other people, and so on and so forth. So it's a general moral decadence that we have to talk about, rather than maybe singling out a particular, um, a particular profession or a particular entity and saying that, you know, things are not going well. Things are not going well everywhere, whether it's our judiciary, whether it's our parliament, whether it's our executive, the media. Things are not going. Every, I mean, things are not going well, and it is as a result of the moral decadence, where people are not no longer ready to stand up for values, stand up for the truth, stand up and sacrifice and say, "Look, this is the right thing, regardless of the consequence. I'm going to pursue it." And people are no longer thinking about the future; they are thinking about themselves and what they make now. And I think that is the problem. Sulaimana, it's 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 been a while. It's good to have you join the conversation. But but that goes to the point. For example, the fourth estate in recent times has come out with that expose, the scholarships, bonanza, and everything in between. And you see the backlash from different quarters. Uh, that is part, those are some of the difficulties when you are pilloried, lampooned, because you're trying to uh, do your, your work. But that also goes back to the message of Sam Jonah when he asks that as the fourth estate, we must defend our democracy. Do you feel as well, because in doing our work, we must also look internally and criticize ourselves, do some introspection. Do you think we are doing enough of that introspection as a media? Where are we getting it wrong in fulfilling that national call? Well, thank you, Ben, and great to reconnect with you again. Um, I, I certainly agree that the media uh, we, we, I don't think that we are doing what is expected of journalism. When we say the, the media are supposed to be the watchdog uh, of society, hold duty bearers accountable, hold the powerful accountable to the powerless, and so on, I don't think that we are... I mean, you can, you can point to uh, isolated cases or isolated um, media organizations, but if you are to generalize you would say that we are not just doing even a quarter of what we should do. But the, the reason then is, or the, the question to ask is, why? And for me, the reasons are, as I have alluded to, we are, we, we are part of the society. And so if the society is increasingly becoming corrupt, we certainly would also become corrupt. If the, if the society is about, look, look, we've gotten to a point where Standing up and doing the right thing in Ghana is almost becoming like a crime. I mean, you talked about the, the recent uh, report by the Fourth Estate. And go online and, and, and see the kind of arguments that people are putting up. So weird, so bizarre. But they must do that in order to survive.
they must do that and run to their to their paymasters and say, "Have you seen that I'm defending you?" So that they can survive, because it's almost like that's the only way to survive, as far as some people are concerned. I, I keep repeating uh, of late that we all say, "Oh, look at what has happened in Senegal." That young guy, you know, he's president, 44 years. Uh, from and, and there are headlines about from prison to president. And I say, look, people are forgetting the sacrifice that this person had to make. People are forgetting the fact that by standing firm and standing upright in defense of certain principles, in defense of democracy and all of that, he had to go to prison. And he was prepared to, go, to do that. He knew what he was doing could take him to prison, but he was prepared to do that. So it's not about looking at, oh, he's now president. Oh, this guy has done well. No, it is about the values that he stood up for. If you talk about Nelson Mandela, we all say, oh, Mandela was a giant in Africa and so on. We no longer mention the fact that he was in prison for about 26 or 27 years. We, 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 have, we have people here in Ghana when our democracy started who were doing the kinds of things, risking their lives and knew that by challenging the PNDC, by challenging the Rollins NDC, we are likely to go to prison. And they knew that this is right. We must do it. By our conscience... We cannot not do that as journalists. But today, Ben, it's anything goes. It's about, I want to also drive a 4x4. Four four. Mm -hmm. I want to also have this. I want to also have that. And um, right from the top, as I keep saying, I, I honestly believe, Ben, it's about the values of our society. If we have a leader who says that I'm going to reset this country by making sure that I am doing the right thing, and by so doing, I'm sure ministers will do the same, and by so doing, I'm sure other people will do. We would have a very massive transformation. But until that happens, if we're talking about, um, which I'm aware to me has set up a radio station and a TV station, you expect him to use that to watch, do the watchdog journalism that will hold MPP accountable. That is not happening. Or it's about, um, uh, um, on the other side, Radio XYZ or Weasel TV or um, the other, wise, other ones that are on the NDC side, and we expect that the people working there will have the freedom to hold the NDC accountable, especially when they are in power. That is not going to happen. And even the, the ones that we cannot directly link to, you know, politicians, the people working there want to make ends meet. The owners want to make ends meet. If you criticize the government, and the government will come after you. The government will make sure that your, your, your advertising channels are being blocked. What can you do? We are in an era where, as a result of all this, people are just quick to say, oh, go to court, oh, go to court. And you ask yourself, why are people so eager to say that, go to court, go to court? Why? Is it the first time we are having the judiciary in Ghana? Why is it that over the last eight years, the... the, 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 the the word, the catchphrase has become, oh, go to court. Why, why are people so, some people so confident in what they will have in court? And it raises the question about, do people have confidence in the judiciary? Our parliament, we have had cases where we are battling in an econom economy that is not doing well, and our parliament is passing, you know, uh, uh, um, tax exemptions, tax exemptions, to the point where even a hotel, a four-star hotel was given a tax exemption under 1D1F. And we've been talking about it, and people are not angry. And people are not angry because everyone wants to survive. So, yes, we can blame the media and expect that, look, as journalists, do your work, you know, as watchdog of society. So we cannot say that if they are not doing it, we shouldn't blame them. But we have to also look at it from a holistic perspective. It's just like the clergy and the imam. We expect them to do the work, the word of, to do the work of God, and therefore, if they are not doing it, we have to take them on. But the reality is that we have we are creating a society where people must survive. And if people must survive, <laughs> am I the only one who is going to make Ghana where it should be? That is what right. people are asking themselves. Simimana. Uh, uh, Yes. If we've lost confidence in individual journalists and some of these institutions, then what about the role of the National Media Commission? Have we lost confidence in them as well? Because they are the ones who are mandated to be, you know, propelling this agenda of patriotism and ensuring that we are being, we are discharging our duties without, you know, biases. So where does it stand, the National Media Commission? Have you lost faith in them completely? 
<laughs> sometimes it's, it's difficult for me to, to say what I should say about the National Media Commission also because <laughs> of, of, of um, my relationship with um, the executive uh, secretary in particular. But otherwise, look, the National Media Commission has become perhaps the most useless institution in this country. And, did, and did, did, if, did, did, did if, you just say that? The National yeah, Media it, Commission it, it, has become what? <laughs> perhaps it, the most it, useless it has institution. Become, I mean, I, I'm sorry to say, it's, it's a difficult one to say because of my relationship with George, but it's not about George, it's about the institution. It's about the National Media Commission. Is, is it about the commission and even how the politicians put people on and then who becomes sometimes bought here and all of that? Is that part of the problem? Uh, that is part of the problem, but that is, that is a, a problem only because... The, the individuals on there are also part of, you know, the whole societal um, decadence that I've talked about. How do because you mean? Why? Like, if, if, you, if you were put there uh, as a representative of the president, you, you get on there and you are elected as chair. Mm. The Constitution makes it clear what you should do. The NMC Act makes it clear what you should do. You are not at the beck and call of the president. You are not supposed to please the president or the government of the day. But what, what do we have? We have a situation where the, 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 the Ghana Journalist Association, in collaboration with all other media actors, decide to act against the abuses that we are witnessing on journalists. And you have the chairman of the National Media Commission come to attack the GJA for that action. And subsequently, what do we see? We see that the persons who are blacklisted go to the GJA almost like kneeling down to beg for forgiveness. And then you have the national chairman of the media commission saying, the, uh, saying things to the contrary. Meanwhile, that is the institution that is supposed to ensure the highest journalistic standards in the country. And that, therefore, includes protecting journalists. Look, the National Media Commission, I think we are where we are in terms of the media community and the, 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 the decadence that we are witnessing in the media. Also because we've had a media commission that is not prepared to work. Hmm. I mean, to, till date, the National Media Commission doesn't even have a website that would enable even wow. students, GJA students, to go, to go on there and say, oh, who are the commissioners? What are the functions? When was it established? What is the NMC Act? And so on and so forth. Why on earth would yeah. up to today... The, the media commission wouldn't even have a website. Why? And ask yourself, over the, the, over the course of oh, the last do. five years or six years. I'm, I'm looking at it now. They have a website, National Media Commission. Oh, well, then maybe that is very, very yes, recent. Yes, they and do. <laughs> and, then, I'm, and then I'm sorry about that. That then yeah. is very, very recent, and we are happy about that. Okay. Because the last time I did, they, they didn't have an, a, a, a website. How, how, so long that, ago, how long ago yeah. was this? This must have been like a, maybe six, seven months ago or so. Okay. Okay. You know, and, and, and I'm saying that, look, we have a media commission. Today, they even issue a statement and people are, people are ready to say, look, um, to, hell with, to hell with the National Media Commission. We don't care about it. You know, you have a media commission when Manasseh did the militia in the heart of the city. The media commission sat down and said, oh, mm. this was uh, unethical, that on just so that they could, gaff, they could, they, they could give the, gaff, the government a briefing space. You ask yourself, what is the National Media Commission doing? It has to take the, the, the NCA to shut down radio stations in Boku. And I say, look, the NCA shouldn't get into that terrain where they say that a media organization, as a result of its content, should, should be shut down because the NCA is, a, is, a, is an arm of the executive. And if you allow that to continue, a time may come, they say, oh, we don't like what Joy News is doing. Or what Joy News is doing has a, uh, implications for national security, and then we want to take it. We want to take it down. We shouldn't get there. It should be the work of the National Media Commission. All right. But uh, we have a commission that is not working. Hmm. Uh, interesting points. But Sweetie Abochi, uh, we decided to check. He yeah. says about six, seven months ago, yeah. there was no website. And, and indeed, it's been a while. But now, interestingly, they do have something. I'm but what are, your, what are your, your remarks on the website? Uh. It needs work, but <laughs> it needs work. It, it needs eh? some work. It needs yeah. a lot of work. It looks like it was just um, they just dumped some information there to create something. I don't well, know. Well, it just maybe it could work. be a starting point. Yeah. But, but let's bring in Afi <laughs> Omoni on on something else that I got. Mm -hmm. By the way, Suleiman Abraima, uh, there are many people reacting. Uh, Abdul Rahman Mohammed says brilliant submission, and uh, this one came through. He has added his name, so I can read it. Togbi Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklu. I'm sure you know whom I'm speaking of. He says, Suleiman Abraima has hit the nail right on the head. Thank him on my behalf. So, Suleiman, 
uh, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo says you are doing uh, great. But, but then, I wanted him to react to some of the things that Suleiman has said. And, and, and I, I, I will let him right. do that in addition to this bit because even as we talk about it, I always want to come back home. I feel part of the problem as well is this um, thinking that, oh, my face is on TV or my voice is on radio and this, so I am somebody. I think that is also that characterization. You see people come into this industry and after a little while they've developed airs and they feel they are walking on air, right? That is why all the time when people, and we've seen some incidents that also reveal how, what people would do just to live a certain lifestyle. That's that is part of the problem yeah. we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You don't have to live to anybody's expectations. I am who I am. When I get to a certain point and I can drive a certain car, I drive. Until then, I make do with what I have. I don't live above my means. And it's this trap of being a celebrity. Mm. Yeah. Too many media people are going around trying to act like celebrities. So me, wherever I go, when they start, oh, celebrity, I tell them, no, I'm not a celebrity. Because I am not. Who is a celebrity? I think that is a part of, a piece of the puzzle we are missing. People get in here and they think, once I'm on TV and there's, hey, I, I am this, and I must live up to certain expectations. That's part of the problem. Um, and I did state, uh, um, from the outset, that uh, some people are in the media for wrong mm. reasons. Some have not been called, and this is a profession which is a calling. And uh, as a result, we, we, we experience all kinds of infractions, you know, the um, standardless journalism and all that. Well, so we need to. And I'm happy um, Sam Jonah hit the nail right on the head. So what he did was not only to, um, and that dress was not media centric, that dress also covered other sections of the society. Mm. Judiciary, um, um, uh, corruption, right. um, a lack of accountability in protecting the public purse. And it, it, was, it was a holistic look at our situation as a nation, it can be likened to a state of the nation address. But it's more objective than what we hear, which is littered with all kinds of uh, propaganda. But this is objective analysis of the Ghanaian situation. So some uh, uh, says some as the media, but he urged the media to repurpose journalism. And still in manner, I, I, I agree with him. You, know, you, 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 could, you, could, you, could, you could hear the, the, the frustration, <laughs> the, the, the lamentations in the presentation. Yes, you know, to the sense of when they describe media commission as the, as the most useless <laughs> institution, institution in Ghana. Some will say, but he's entitled to his opinion. So, um, in the face of this crisis, the media must rise above the free. You know, by virtue of what we do, you know, we exercise oversized responsibility over all arms of government. We are supposed to be the conscience of the public. Mm. So, so if the media you know, get it right, then we are inclined to believe that others, then we, we can whip others in line so that we rediscover ourselves as a serious nation, as a beacon of democratic accomplishment in Africa, yeah. as a country which values freedom of the media, as a country which is also a beacon of rule of law, as a country which lives in peace with itself and peace with the rest of the world. This the media can do by repurposing journalism. And how do we do it? By discovering what we are supposed to do, but by going back to the drawing board, by doing introspection, serious introspection, which uh, Ben alluded to, we need to look within ourselves. Where are we going wrong? How do we rectify our wrongs and regain the confidence and respect as the fourth estate of the realm? Right. It is not for nothing that the media or journalism is described as the best profession in the world. According to um, uh, Puliza, the best profession is not uh, law, it's not mm -hmm. politics. If you have policies to give you unfettered access to cash mm -hmm. legally, mm -hmm. uh, legally, 
the best profession is not priesthood, even though it comes with intrinsic anointing. The best profession is journalism. So we need to live up to expectation as practitioners of the best profession in the world by holding to account people in positions of power, by doing the right thing. Because we cannot, you know, we, we cannot exhibit disconnect between what we do and what we preach. We should preach um, professionalism, we should preach objectivity, we should act objectively, we should objectivize whatever we do. We should, as a, as, as a media institution, responsible media institution, we should tell our stories, we should shape our programs, we should, we should design our discussions to ensure that this nation rediscover itself and be on the trajectory of advancement, advancement hmm. in all dimensions. And maybe as right. we cap off the conversation, there's an interesting bit as well I'd like to put to, and I'm sure Suleiman Abraima as well will have a reaction. But before that, Abdul Rahman Aaron uh, Godo on the mainstream says, congratulations, Mr. Abraima, you've always been serious with what you do. This is traceable to our days in UCC when we were both residents of Valco Hall. And uh, keep doing your best appreciation. That's the message in there. Solomon Nyantichi says, uh, Suleiman Abraima is absolutely right. The NMC is, okay, I'll not go on to repeat that. And I can't believe it is headed by blah, blah, blah. Okay. So my final bit to you, though, when you think if you move away from the financial influences and how people are poor, so sometimes a media person may be trying to make ends meet. So he's pondering or she is pondering. If you don't have that moral compass, it becomes difficult. Some of us don't care. And we've been bashed from both sides. We remain in the middle and we don't care when it's, whose ox is gone. We'll say it as it is. But there's also this bit about fear. 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 Look at our rankings when it comes to the, what, what do you even call them? The media, the, the indices and, and yeah, the rest. Yeah, yeah. We've been falling over the years. Falling, yeah. Look at how many media houses, UTV, mm. XYZ, even here at some point, you've had people rush in, beat people, do X, do Y, do Z. People may have a problem with, um, what's his name? The, um, the, the Tiger IPI gentleman, what's his name again? Uh, um, Anessa, Anessa. No. Um, is it, is it uh, the one who got killed? Oh, Ahmed, Ahmed, Ahmed Swale, yeah, yeah. the name Swale. because of yeah. Ahmed Swale and everything. Yes, you may have your problems. But if you look at that trajectory, you also begin to understand why some people will see black and say it is white for fear of the consequences. And some of us get that fear. We get that fear. We have been, and we have been pursued, sent messages, called. Obviously, if you, you can't stand by it, People will fall away. And that question is to both of you, Suleimana and um, Afil Moni. I'll start with you, Suleimana, and then we'll wind down on the conversation. Because with your investigations, I'm sure you get uh, quite a bit of that as well. Ben, um, I, I always say that uh, on the African continent, given the, the governments we have and the governments that we have, if you are a journalist, and the government is happy with you, then you are not doing journalism. <laughs> because because we, we have governments that really are not pursuing the interests of the people, and journalism is about the interests of the people. And therefore, at all times, you would be on the opposite side. And, and so if you are doing journalism and the government is happy with you and praises you and all of that, then maybe you are doing something else. That's the starting point. And therefore, if you want to do journalism, then you should tell yourself that, look, this is my calling. I am representing the interests of the people. If, as a result of my work, the government is okay, that's fine. If the government is not okay, well, that's, that's my job to do. The, the threat and the fear that you are saying is real. We are all human beings. I get people sending me messages to say, hey, but you guy, you, are you not afraid? Do you, have, do you have security in your house? Do you have bulletproof car? This kind of thing that you are doing and this kind of society that we are in now, you know, uh, I'm afraid for you. Well, I tell, I tell people, if that is what I have to do, that is what I must do. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's either I do that or I join the other side. Look, Ben, I, 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 some of the people in politics today were my mates. Um, 
I, I wouldn't say that they were smarter than me. There are some of them who got third class, second class lower. I graduated with first class. You know, in my master's program, I was the overall best student. I, I think that I'm as smart as some of them who are there. Some of them have multiple houses, multiple cars, and so on and so forth. <laughs> it is either you choose to be there or you choose to do what you want to do. Yeah. And if you choose not to be there, then do what you want to do and do it right. I mean, we just started the fourth estate just less than three years ago or about three years ago. And, you know, you know what has happened. This is just online. We don't have a radio. We don't have television station. It's all about doing the stories and doing it right. There are people out there who still love this country and would want to see people do the right thing. I commend multimedia all the time, because throughout the turbulence, multimedia has stood up to the test. Whether MPP is in power or NDC is in power, you know, multimedia is often accused of not supporting government or being against government. And for me, that is journalism. So the fear is real, but I, I tell people, look, if you want to do journalism, do it. Whatever the case, as, as President Kufuado said, all die be die. You know, whether, whether you do the right thing or you do the wrong thing, one day you will die. But stand up for your conscience. And, 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 and always remember that you also want to be remembered one day for doing something right. But otherwise, I don't think that it is the richest people who die and they get all the, you know, national and international acclaim. When Nelson Mandela died and, and the, the funeral was a global funeral, it wasn't because he was the richest man in the world. It was because he stood up for some principle. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, it's not because he was, you know, the, just the greatest boxer or the richest person. It is because he stood up for some principles. Kwame Nkrumah is still celebrated. You know, you go to the AU headquarters at, at, in, at Addis and his, his statue is there. It's not because he was the richest, the richest Ghanaian who ever lived. It is because he stood up for some principles. So when I look at people, especially our leaders who and, get... And, the and if, I, if, I, if I may briefly add, uh, Busumuru Kofi Annan of blessed memory, I guess at some point uh, the, 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 the reflection was that he had, um, he was worth $5 million or something of the sort. Nothing compared to the big business tycoons and the rest. But look at his reputation when you exactly. mentioned his name. It's not exactly. in the money he had, it's in what he stood for. Exactly. So for me, my encouragement, especially to the young ones, and that is why we have started this Next Generation Investigative Journalism Fellowship, to see if we can cut people young and groom them. And then, look, the fourth estate, the, the, the current staff that we have on the fourth estate or doing the fourth estate project, maybe three of them or so are people that you would say have more than five years uh, uh, journalism experience. The rest of them, maybe two years, came to do national service, came to do the fellowship, and we tapped them in. It's about the orientation and the values that people stand for. Yeah. If they have it, they would be able to do the impactful thing. And I think that right. is why multimedia over the years you've done the right thing. Mm. The fear is real. The government doesn't want to budge. There are clandestine moves, sometimes stifling media organizations of, 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 of their advertising revenues, um, sometimes calling editors to say, why did you put this up and why not that? To the extent of sometimes doing the weird things of even asking, why did you use this picture of the president instead of the other picture? Mm. This is the situation that we are in. Right. But I would encourage those who want to do journalism to, to, to know that they have power. But that power would only come up if they do their work and do it right. We've been to Kumasi in, in, in 2016 elections. We were in Kumasi. With and the and Mana, we have to wrap because of time, but you, you, you conclude. Yes, with, with the chairman of the NMC then, other members of the NMC, other media academics, we visited the radio station, talked to them about the infractions that we, we were monitoring and recording on their platform, and they said, yeah, we know all this that you are saying, but, you know, we want our party to come to power, and so we'll continue to do what we are doing, which you think is unethical. And they just said it like that, and nobody could take them on. So that is the situation we are in. We have to just appeal to the moral conscience of people to do the right thing. Thank you so much. So the fear is real, but we have power. How would you cup it up? Um, journalism is not for the lily livid mm. and chicken hearted. I made a point yesterday, and best repeating, that journalism is for courageous, brave people who have been called to practice the best profession, profession in, the, in the world. That is journalism. So even though our, uh, uh, we, we, we need to always look at the back of our memory that journalism is not cash rich, but risk prone profession. Mm. 
So what? Yeah, you're using terms yeah, here again. Like Not cash, cash risk, risk, but risk prone. Risk prone. prone. Yeah. Mm. So, so once you are in it, know that by virtue of being on the side of rectitude, right. by being on the side of truth, by holding people to account for their misdeeds, they will come after you. Why urge journalists not to fall prey, easy prey to, to attacks? Mm. You know, we should be quoting cheap matido, but we should be unafraid and unintimidated as long as we are on the side of the truth. So, in simple terms, let's be fearless. Let's be independent, credible. let's be credible, credible, the way Benjamin says it. <laughs> but that's why I slightly disagree with um, Sir Sam Jonah, that he okay. can't trust journalists, you know, to be credible in covering the elections. We can trust some journalists, you can trust us. I, I, I don't think media. he necessarily meant it as a blanket that yes. every last yes. Yes. one. I'm just saying that there's still hope. There's still a yeah. few of us out there yeah, yeah. who are doing the work mm. for God and country. So, that is where we are wrapping up. But do you want to share any final no, thoughts here? Yeah, so that's the end. We spoke to, in studio here with us, is Dr. Roland Afelmoni. He's a former DJA president. And then Roland is my colonial name. Ah, <laughs> so you just go by Afelmoni now. Okay, great. And we also, um, Suleimana Braima also joined us on phone. He's the executive director for Media Foundation for West Africa. And of course, the Benjamin Akapo. Yes, a big Ben. <laughs> With us. But there's still more to come. The National Union of Ghana Students is working to ensure students have the best of conditions to study in. It's appalled by how long the teacher strike has gone on for. It's also given its take on President Okufado's statements that the national service personnel are underutilized. That's the conversation coming up next with NUC's President Trema Opong Daniel. He's our guest later on in the show. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the program. The NUGS president, Trema Pong Daniel, has joined me in the studio. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. How are you doing this I'm morning? I'm fine, by grace. Yeah? yeah? You have a lot to say on some of the things happening in the country. Let's yeah. start with the education in the yeah, sector, of course. Um, the ongoing strike, which was suspended about a month ago. Yeah. And as we speak, there's a meeting ongoing, or there are a series of meetings ongoing to seek some sort of conclusion to this matter. But yeah. what is your assessment of the situation? All right, we want to extend warm greetings to the over 12.5 million Ghanaian students who are watching this show. I know a lot of our students are following, wanting to hear a lot happening in the educational sector. I've always opined that, um, especially in an election year, whatever thing that decides election mostly has to do with education. Mm -hmm. Right from some years ago, where we had FQ, we had the introduction of free senior high school, we had a lot of introductions when it comes to education. So education is a key priority that the National Union of Ghana students doesn't joke with us, our motto goes, education is a right and not a privilege. Um, I think we are at a point worried at the consistent um, strike actions that is happening over the past years. It's not just this year alone. Mm. Almost past 10 years plus, we've been having consistent um, strike actions from these teacher unions, which is very detrimental to the progress of our education in this country. So as the student front that are direct benefits of um, our educational system, we sit back and uh, if, if we find it very problematic and quite distressing, especially when we come to school to study and then you sit back and within a short while teachers are going on strike, within a short while others are also going on strike. And it's worrying and it's becoming more or less like a political thing mm. that at a point people who are leading some of the unions take an entrenched position even after consistent meetings or not. It's, it's very detrimental to our front. So one thing we've been pushing over the past years is the non-politicization of our educational system. We feel that if you are politicizing anything in this country, one of the key places that should not be politicized is our educational system. And immediately the educational system is politicized. It affects the very fabric of our young people in this country because the general transformation and metamorphosis happening when it comes to shaping the minds of our young people all has to do with education so in case immediately we find a hitch 
with the educational system, it affects all young people in this country. So whenever there's okay. a strike, it's something that keeps us worried. So as we speak, the teachers are back in the classrooms, pending a conclusion to the yeah. meetings. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. So okay. I, I visited the ministry, I think, last two days. Mm. I think upon getting there, there were a lot of consistent meetings, and it, it, it stayed throughout the, uh, the night. It started around, some, around 10 to even the late evening, 8 there which clearly tells you that at a point they are also not sitting aloof in watching these things go because... The um, ministry, you mean? The ministry, okay. yeah. The ministry of there, education. Exactly. I went there to monitor most of the things happening because we didn't want to sit back and always come to the media and now we are calling. We want our teachers to get back, not take an entrenched position. I went there to make an inquiry on a swift measure that could be put in place to get our teachers back. So when I went there, fortunate enough, all the union leaders were there to sit with the... Uh, the Ministry of Education, the Director General of Education, and all the others to find practicable measures in solving the solution. We feel that this long due, that we should have a permanent solution to this. We shouldn't be having a lot of consistent strike each and every year because next year is going to happen again. The next two years is happening again. And we tend to politicize everything. So I feel there should be a roadmap, there should be a plan that will help keep this particular thing once and for all because it doesn't happen in other jurisdictions. So why is it always happening in Ghana? We could have we could find an antidote to this particular issue. And I do believe if that is done, we'll go a long way in helping. And it's not just the ministry, the, uh, the teacher unions as well. I think we should be able to uh, stay with this sit and then fine-tune a plan so that these things doesn't reoccur really okay again. Because I said, if two uh, uh, elephants are fighting in the forest, it's just, there's grasses that surface. In this case, you are the grass. But you have you right. had any engagement with the teachers unions? Um, since, I mean, so far? Have you, have you had any conversations with them? All right, so... Um, when, we, when it started, especially with the basic school, we started engaging some of the teacher unions, one or two of them, to find out what is really happening. And at a point, some of them have genuine issues that um, they feel should be well addressed. But amidst all these particular worrying issues that I feel the ministry is also having one or two issues they are also encountering. For us as students, we always take a biased uh, um, um, position that if for nothing at all, things should be right so that education could continue. So we've been engaging them whenever there's this issue. Almost every student in Ghana is calling our office to find out the next steps the National Union of Ghana student is taking to ensure our teachers are getting back. As, as um, a union that believes it's stakeholder engagement, swiftly, always I'm at the Ministry of Education, almost each and every time, to find out what is happening, to send issues, worrying the students front end. Good enough, we've had um, a ministry that at a point is ready to accept most of the worrying issues right. of the front. right. Let's um, shift our focus to this national service scheme. In the vice president, flag bearer of the NPP's yeah. bold solutions for yeah. the future, he said that he wanted to make national service optional. <laughs> but a few days ago, the president launched a 10-year policy plan, policy framework for the national service scheme, saying that as it stands, the personnel are underutilized. And you have something to say on that front. <laughs> 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 All right, so... We've had our own take on the national service okay. because we feel that, you see, when we get to a time where national service, though we, we, we love the optional idea, mm. but... You do? At a point, yes. Okay. But we have our own suggestions to the optional. Mm. Because it's made that today myself, Chairman Upon Daniel, sitting here, enters and then becomes thoroughly optional for me. Most of our Ghanaian students will not want to um, engage themselves in national service. Mm. And as we are making provisions that in case myself, I complete school, I get a job, and I, I make presentations that this, I've gotten this particular job, then there are exceptions for those special groups of people. Else, I might get to a stage in our country where the spirit of volunteerism, the spirit of patriotism will all leave our, our young people, especially in our current situation, which is very detrimental. We have, mm. no, most of our youth don't want to volunteer anymore. Um, and even give out their all in helping. And this, the main reason why most of these things were initiated was that we institute or we inculcate that sense of patriotism, that sense of volunteerism. We've been having a lot of worrying issues, especially when one gets a job or one is even traveling out of the country and all that and need the national service, um, uh, would, the national service certificate becomes key thing yeah. that will augment whatever thing they are doing. We always opine that it should be an option. So when they are when these things are coming of making it optional, we are, the optional, how, what we understand is that there should be a section where if you're having a job, if you're having anything you want to do, 
you present those tasks and then you are exempted. But, but I think that's, that's what he, he if, meant. That's no, what Zbalmia meant. We are making right. it general that imagine we are all done. Mm -hmm. I can decide to do the service or not. Okay. And if that door is open, we have a lot of our students out there who on a normal day would not want to do. And when it comes to the underutilization of national service personnel, mm. trust me now, most of our service personnel will want to be having all their, their service at Ghana Gas, Ministry of Finance and all this. So you get to some of these places and most of these service personnel are sitting outside doing nothing. So I understand the president's take on the underutilization right. of the, um, the national service in this country. Mm -hmm. I feel one key area that we are not focusing much of our attention on is agriculture. Okay. So on our education conference on Monday, one thing we'll be proposing is that the agriculture bit of our education should be made key. As we are focusing on STEM, they should be, we should have STEAM, which have uh, science, technology, engineering, agriculture, agriculture and right. mathematics. We should have that set because if we want to change the very fortunes of our country, one of the key things or one of the key areas we should focus on is our agriculture. And that is what the national service scheme should also be tuning the minds of service personnel who want to have service in that particular sector. So we've had, we've had that mindset that right after school, you should find yourself in a very comfortable job, sitting under the air condition and all that, forgetting that that particular area, if probably we've psyched this up, we could also send personnel, we could also develop our personnel through that very avenue in changing the very right. fortunes and economy of this country. Were you engaged? Was it, did the government engage you before forming this policy framework? Was there any kind of engagement at all? Um, we were at the launch of the program. Oh. Yeah, we were invited to be there to witness the policy and everything. Um, but we didn't have any thorough um, engagement. engagement with us on our take on what will be inculcated or what is forming the framework of the policy that was coming up. But what's your take on the policy itself? Um, Do you think that it's a step in the right direction? Because again, you mentioned that you agree with the president that the personnel are underutilized. Of yeah. course, a lot of people don't want to go and serve in, you know, the CNC somewhere in some village where they don't have access to internet and good roads and stuff. So what's, what's your take on it? All right, so um, um, I, I, I mean, I connect with the what the president said that at a point you see most of you see when uh, the vice president spoke, um, made an announcement on national service being optional mm -hmm. a lot of our national service personnel and most of our students were happy why because when they get to these places they are not doing anything most of these national service personnel tend to be um, uh, <laughs> people others have been sending to buy stars for them delivery guys and all those kind of things so if possibly it's, we clearly understand the underutilization. Okay, so, so if you are making, there should be provisions. Mm -hmm. That is what the policy is suggesting, that most of our, there shouldn't be a chunk of our NNSS personnel, all, all centered in Accra, the ministries, nobody will want to get to those places. You see, when you travel to some of the villages, it, it has no national service personnel there. When you travel to some of the areas, it has no national service. When you get closer to national service, per their data. Sometimes most of the companies, IT companies and all the others, need service personnel who could work there. But everybody wants Ghana gas, everybody wants Ministry of Finance. So the underutilization then comes in. So if you are bringing up a policy that will help with the proper segregation, that will help with the proper segmentation of these um, national service personnel to specific areas that need our services, I do believe productivity will also go high and also okay. serve the main purpose why the national service scheme was established. Before we talk about the NUCS education conference coming up, I just want to clarify that not only do they want to disperse personnel into appropriate places or places where they need help, but they want to offer mentoring, training, and some other um, skills IT training, school, IT yeah. skills training, for, which is something that doesn't exist, yeah. right? Yeah. So is, that's, the, that's the question I was asking, whether this is, do you think that this is a solution to our problems, the problems of national service personnel? All right, so um, when you get to national service, even currently I noticed they've started some IT trainings and all that. You see, I feel we've gotten to that stage in life where we would have to critically and intentionally equip our youth coming up. Because here is the case, one finishes NSS, you get closer to the person and there's nothing to write home about. So if we are going to put such strategic um, initiative to train, to equip the young one, then trust me, even after completing and you have no job, you are equipped with one or two skills that could help you maneuver your way through this difficult moment we find ourselves in. Right, right. So now tell me about this NUGS Education Conference. All right, so the NUGS Education Conference um, is 
a program that we are trying to engage various sectors, especially in our educational sector, to voice out most of the worrying issues affecting us in our educational sector and also know what is really happening in our educational sector. We had the first one in Kumasi at K University where we invited over 2,000 plus student leaders from different places, from senior high schools, from tertiary, from teacher trainings and all that to come and engage the ministry on happenings in our educational sector. We feel we should this being a strategic year, we should have strategic meetings with every stakeholder in this particular country. So soon, we'll be engaging the Ministry of, Edu we've engaged the Ministry of Education, we're engaging the Ministry of Energy, we'll be engaging the presidency, we'll be engaging even presidential aspirants who are running for various positions because mm. always it's the youth who's been deciding the elections of this country. So it will be very imperative we set up the stage to have them engaged. Then student leaders could then point out what are the new things that are coming into our educational sector. What is the new development that is coming, especially when we sit in a country where a statutory funds, that funds education in this country has been capped, which is the get fund. Yeah. We still stand on our feet How to clearly say. How is that going? Still we are still pushing and um, <laughs> during the educational conference we are going to hit on it. Okay. The next time we'll be coming, we'll be in the street, we'll be picketing and telling the government and even policymakers why we should uncap get fund because that's the main statutory fund that is funding a lot of things happening in the country. I see a lot of people speaking about classrooms under trees. I see a lot of people speaking about a lot of happenings, though we are seeing a lot of development in our educational sector. If you don't uncap get fund, it will be very difficult to see a lot of development happening yeah. in our yeah. student front. And we want to send it clearly out there that the student front, are, we are never quiet. You know, whenever there's any worrying issues, we we'll never take um, a certain position that will benefit anybody. Once there's any worrying issue, we very strong, fearlessly speak at those issues to ensure Ghanaian students are okay. So I mean, you've been very vocal about, you know, get found, these teachers strike. Yeah. I keep seeing your name pop up in articles yeah. about how you want to make government do right by students. Exactly. I mean, and if by the time I'm leaving office, if I, I should be remembered for one thing. I mm. think one thing I want to be remembered for is I played, a, I played a pivotal role in the uncapping of Get Fund. <laughs> and I, I want to send it across that student leaders or every student in the country is never going to sleep. We are not going to sit aloof until Get Fund is uncapped. Immediately, we un the reason why we are very passionate about the uncapping of Get Fund is that in the old, old days when they were establishing Get Fund, mm. NUCS played a fulcrum role in its establishment. So the main reason why we established it was basically to support our educational system, serve as a shock absorber to our educational system. But here we get here today, and something different is happening, we've capped it. So one of the key things we'll be focusing on, especially during the program that I'll be speaking of, it's mm. about the, um, the uncapping of GetFan. I want right. to also give uh, the various sectors an opportunity to enlighten Ghanaian students on what is happening in the educational sector. And good enough, anytime you go there, they are ready to uh, accept us. Anytime we send out issues, they are ready to listen. We'll be coming up with huge issues. Right. We'll be coming up with more issues in the coming days. It's happening on the UPSA campus, um, okay. on Hine Konadu Auditorium, exactly on the 22nd of April, which is on Monday, 8 a.m. And we are Monday. expecting all students to come there to engage the ministry. This is not just the normal talk where we invite people to just come and speak and then they leave. We will be engaging the Minister for Education, Director there General of GES. Oh, exactly. I'm sure they'll put it back on the details of the flyer, the Capitals Edition, Nukes Education Conference. And this is the second time you're doing this, exactly. right? Happening at uh, the UPSC Auditorium, exactly. you say? Yeah. Right. So we'll be inviting all these speakers. We'll be speaking mm. on national service. Now, a lot of our students are asking questions on national service. Mm. We're inviting the, the executive director of national service. Students in this can now boldly get closer to these stakeholders and then ask whatever question that is worrying them. Always it's been asked. This particular time, I want to give them an opportunity to ask genuine questions that is worrying them. Issues okay. on free senior high school, issues on tertiary education, issues on accommodation, and other worrying issues affecting our students. So we are inviting all students, we are inviting all media stations, including Joy News and all the other media stations to be there and cover this particular event. And we are hoping that even in the coming days, we'll be able to change the fortunes of our educational sector. Well, congratulations, Chairman Pong. You. You're doing great. Thank you. So you mean all students, junior high, senior yeah. high, tertiary, all students? All yeah. students. Since NUCS captures every student in Ghana, yeah. so we are inviting each and everybody to be thank there. You. Well, yeah. thank you You're for doing this. Stakeholder engagement is always important in yeah. national development agenda. So do well to attend. It's the education, NUCS Education Conference happening next week, Monday, at the UPSC Auditorium.
But there's still more to come. We'll hear from SOS Children's Villages. It's been a transformative force for 50 years, providing crucial support and care to vulnerable children and families across the nation. So we'll tell you how to support them on this feat and ensure it works better. Stay with me. Welcome back on the show. It's time now for us to engage my guests in the studio so that we talk about SOS Children's Villages. I mean, even before getting to our guests, you know, whatever you hear about SOS and the impactful work they do in the lives of needy people, it's heart touching. And now the term has become, you know, synonymous to anything, anytime that someone needs help, they're like SOS. So SOS Children, uh, SOS Children's Village. Joining me in the studio for this conversation is Edith Ifwa Hiagbe, the Communication and Brands Manager for SOS Children's Villages in Ghana, and Josiah Bernard Nati, National Child Safeguarding Advisor, SOS Children's Villages in Ghana. Did I get your name right? Yes, Great. Please. Lady and gentlemen, thank you. I just found out off air that that's my elder sister. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. I mean, SOS is doing great. But briefly, can you tell me about this venture and the work you've been doing for over 50 years now? Okay, let, let me get started. Yeah. Mm. Um, I want to say good morning to our charity viewers. And then I thank your station for inviting us to tell our story. I want to start by indicating that normally when you mention SOS, people assign all kinds of meanings to that acronym. But the acronym is not save our souls. As oh, it's not? People have been hearing what is it? indicating. No. The acronym is social society. You know, it is derived from a Latin phrase, societas socialis, okay. social society. A society of people, a society that has structures in place that promote the well-being of children. So if you look at the organization, we are an independent social development organization working in the best interest of needy children. And the work we do is to ensure that we provide care in the family setting, we protect the children and also partner others to do advocacy for child rights. So basically, this is what we do. And you've been doing this for 50 years. How yes, has the Ghana. journey been? In Ghana alone for 50 in, years. Yeah, 50 years. Yeah, how has the journey been? Um, it, it's, been it's not been a so smooth journey in terms of um, challenges that we encounter in terms of fundraising right. and all that. But um, I'll be quick to also say that the journey is 75 years globally. Oh. It started in 1949 okay. in a little village called East in Austria. Okay. And uh, Ghana is 50. Over here in Ghana, we started in Isia, um, Tama, Community 6, in 1974. Okay. In 92, we came up with the uh, Isiaqua village, opened by the late Jerry Rawlings. Okay. In 2010, Two days apart, Tamale and Kumasi villages were also added. Um, initially, we were known for only um, providing residential care for children. But from the early 2000s, we have evolved as an organization and we are now a complete social development organization mm -hmm. and we do more community empowerment interventions. We do the economic empowerment of families facing difficult situations so that children can remain in the safety net of those families. We make sure that our youth in the communities do not loiter about. We provide them with the right skills to attract the right employment. But like I said, it has not been an easy journey because we do all this with fans. And normally when you talk about SOS, people have this misconception that we are a rich organization. <laughs> and because you're receiving a lot of donations. No, and we all don't. That. I no, think that, that I'm feeding into the perception that mm -hmm. people have. That but but that is not of... it. Okay. 
That is not it. We, we, I will answer this always by saying that it means that we're putting to good use the funds that we are receiving from our donors. And also, you don't take a child out of helplessness and dump that child into another state of helplessness. You provide an environment where that child gets up in the morning and realizes that, ah, I am in an environment that provides hope. Yeah. That is why you see us well-branded as a rich organization. But we rely on donations of you and other well-meaning individuals to make sure that this is done. Okay. Let, let, let me we, add that sure. we, we run two main programs. Okay. And then the programs are based on the fact that we categorize our target group into two. Okay. We mention needy children as our target group. Mm -hmm. But we have children who have lost parental care completely. And they are the ones that we provide alternative care for. And so when we go to our SOS villages, one of the care options we have is the SOS family, where the children are. And then the second group are children who stand the risk of losing parental care. How do we negate the problem of being abandoned? And so we provide support to their families of oh, origin. Okay. And once we build their capacity, they are able to live together and take care of their children. You so know, you're not only caring for children, orphan children, needy children, no, but you no. also direct some of your resources to helping parents yes. so that they can live, they can have a family together, together yes. with their yes. children. So, we, we so do they don't abandon the children. Okay. And once that is done, we are able to reach out to many more children. Because if you look at the work that we're doing to date, for the 50 years, we have been able to support 4,000 children in the SOS village, SOS family, the family like care we provide. But when it comes to um, our family strengthening program, we've supported more than 135,000 children. So you can imagine. And there are 43,000 families. You know, I can imagine. so that is it. It is, you wanted to say something. I was going to ask you that, looking at the number or the magnitude of children you help and families that you help, have you formed any um, formidable, valuable partnerships that is helping you propel your agenda? Yes, we have a lot of um, corporate partnerships. Okay. We have a lot of developmental organizations that we partner with. For instance, uh, we run, like he said, to add to what he said and then yeah. answer your question mm -hmm. as well, we're running a child labor and trafficking project called Protecting the Future. Okay. And the which children on the Volta Lake or in uh, the worst forms of child labor are rescued rehabilitated and reintegrated back into society. And if you look at the causal um, factors of child labor and trafficking, you realize that it is basically poverty. So we empower, we economically empower the capacities of these families so that once the children are reintegrated back, the families are sustaining so that the children are not trafficked back. How do you achieve that? Is it by... Um getting them some trade? How, how do you, you tell oh, me? How okay, so what that? we normally do mm -hmm. is we don't force the families to take up particular skills. Okay. We have, um, in, in, under the Family Strengthening Program, we have a family development plan. Mm -hmm. So the experts sit with these families, discuss with them what they want to do. Right. And then progressively, some want to trade, we give them capital, and then we give them um, um, business management skills, communication skills, customer service skills, how to add value to your package, and all that. And we monitor their progress till we are sure that, yes, they've become self-reliant. Well, after then, what she said, I, okay, I don't her, to, yeah. Are you done? Let her finish, and I, I'll I want bring to you add back a bit to what all right. she said. You asked a question about partnership building. Mm. We do that at three levels. Okay. We, from the governmental level, mm -hmm. and then we come to the community level, mm -hmm. and then the NGO level. Okay. At the governmental level, we have the Department of Social Welfare mm -hmm. being our main partners. Yes. You know, okay. because they are the agency of government mm -hmm. that ensures that the vulnerable segments of the society are cared for. Okay. So we do that with them, different partnerships. Mm -hmm. And then at the community level, we do with the MMDAs, Okay. The uh, municipal yeah. yes, authorities, we make sure that we do that at the community level. And also, uh, at the uh, community level, we support the 
community-based organizations. Mm. We strengthen their capacity to ensure that they protect their children and also take good care of them. For example, when you go to the communities, we have what we call the community child protection committees. And we provide training for them to build them up to be able to protect their children living in those communities. So we okay. do that. And then at the NGO level, we partner uh, World Vision, for example. Yeah. We partner UNICEF and other establishments okay. to make sure that the goal of caring and for children and protecting them is achieved. All right. So, but Edith, you oh, wanted me, to finish yes, your Yes, so um, with a project like this, we are not running alone in the community. Okay. Like you said, we partner with other child welfare organizations. Mm. SOS, for instance, doesn't have a shelter, but our partner has a shelter. Oh, so okay. when these children are rescued, they are taken to this shelter and rehabilitated their um, mental uh, health Every, they, they are well thoroughly checked and then we identify what they want to do. We have success stories of some of these children in apprenticeship. Some are now self-reliant. We do this with partners at the community level. And like he said, we partner with DSW even at the community level. Okay. Now, when it comes to our alternative care, like he said, we partner with DSW because that is where the children come from. They bring in the children. They are part of our gatekeeping um, committees at the um, location level. Okay. They, they are our implementers. Okay. In other jurisdictions, we partner with other child welfare organizations, world organizations, okay. to make sure that, yes, we are successful. So we have a lot of partnerships. Okay, you mm -hmm. said rescued. When these children are rescued, could you shed a little light on that? In what states do these children come to you and how exactly do you rescue? And then we can talk about activities to mark the 50th anniversary. Edith. Okay, so what happens is these children are sold into slavery for some, sometimes as little as 200 Ghana cities. What? Yes, their parents are not able to cater for them. Some um, were sold into slavery by their sisters. And so together with our partner, Challenging Heights, we identify oh. these children and these children are rescued together with uh, the law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. and taken to our partner's shelter. And like I said, they're taken through a lot of counseling because they've gone through a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so you cannot just pick them from that place and yeah. dump them on society. You need to work on their behavior. Some pick up some deviant um, behaviors over there. Yeah. So you need to treat all that before you reintegrate them back into their families. There are, according to the um, last GSS survey, there are over 50,000 children working on the lake. And um, we hmm. have, we are, we are, SOS is actually a member of the Coalition of NGOs Against Child Trafficking in Ghana, SINAT. So we work with some of these partners to um, make sure that the children who are on the lake are identified yeah, and rescued. And rescued. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by rescue. L let me add a bit. Yeah. Now, when we talk about the rescue, it's, it's got a different thing. It doesn't end with just the rescue. Mm. After we've rescued the children, we do rehabilitation. It is I important that when you rescue the children, you rehabilitate them, mm. and then you reintegrate them back into society because of the fact that they've been trafficked. They've been isolated from their families. They've been isolated from their communities of, of origin. So once you do the rescue and rehabilitation, you need to take them back. And so that they start life all them. over again yeah. and make progress. Because at the end of the day, the child should develop to their highest potential. Mm. And that is it. Okay? Okay. But you ask the general question about the rescue too. Mm. You see, when we come across children who fall within our target group, we conduct an assessment, we conduct an investigation, and then we identify the care option that is most suited to that kind, that child situation. Okay. And that is what we, we do in alternative care. Mm. So you find children in the SOS village as a measure of last resort, and then if we find with the uh, cooperation of the Department of Social Welfare that this child has to be fostered into a family, the child goes into foster care. We also have another option called emergency care mm. or short-term care. Mm. When we identify children, the Department of Social Welfare will conduct all the investigations and bring the children to come and stay in our facility in Terma, Siakwa or Kumasi for some time. And then during the period, 
they continue to do the assessment, and then when the situation is settled from where the child is coming from, the child is reintegrated into, into society. the society. I think so you're doing that is the key thing that we do. It's commendable. Now, how are you marking this 50th anniversary? And just to be clear, it's 50 years operations in Ghana alone, but globally, 75, 75 years. Yes. How are you marking it? Um, we have um, a series of activities. Mm. Um, the, we've unveiled our logo. Okay. We've had floats around. Is the, that what you're wearing? Yes, I'm okay. wearing the 50th anniversary T-shirt. That is the 50th anniversary logo. Proudly, eh? You can see, see, <laughs> you can see uh, Ghana yeah. with SOS celebrating 50 yeah. years of transforming lives in Ghana yeah. written in there. And um, our logo is based on the fact that we realize we've made a lot of impact. Then the cyan represents stability. If you look at our logo itself, you see a boy and a girl stable there. This uh, cyan blue represents that. Okay. And then also we are across Ghana. That is yeah. why we are embedded in Ghana. Okay. So um, like I was saying, we had, um, we unveiled the our unveiling. logo, we had yeah. a float. Next is a sports festival. Oh. We want to have a sports festival with, uh, at our four locations mm. with our stakeholders. We want to play um, different games with okay. them to see the other side of us. We are not all, always uh, children, children, children. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> focus. And so there is an anniversary cap at stake. Okay. Um, we have been sorry. Who's playing? Children or you? The facilitators? Everybody's playing. Everybody's playing. Everybody's playing. playing. Right. Everybody is playing. Okay. We we have a conference on alternative care in Ghana. Okay. Um, that is the first of its kind. Okay. We want to share our experience with other stakeholders and also learn from them. Okay. Um, we have an awards and dinner where we intend to honor people who have supported the dream for the past 50 years in Ghana. Okay. At the location level, we want to honor our long-serving staff. Some staff have been here for over 20 years, some over 30 years, right? Mm, we want okay. to uh, recognize and honor them. We have tree planting exercises. Okay. We have exhibitions have by things. years. Yeah. We, it's 50 years, yes, you know, so we course. want to showcase what we have been doing. Right. So uh, we have exhibition days where people can walk in and see some of the beautiful things that we've done over the, the past 50 now, I'm years. sure those will, our audience will, some of them will love to get in touch to support, so love to get in touch just to participate in some of these activities. How can they reach you? And then we can wrap it up. Okay, officially, our number is 024 197763. Mm. You can reach us via any of our social media pages um, on Facebook, SOS Children's Villages Ghana, on Twitter at LX. SOS TV Ghana, on Instagram, SOS Children's Villages Ghana. You can watch our beautiful story on YouTube, SOS Children's Villages Ghana, on LinkedIn, SOS Children's Villages in Ghana. All right. You can also send us an email, sosghana.sos at sosghana.org. Okay, yes. thank you so much. Your final words, and then we're, we're done. All right. I think that our organization is going through transformational change. Mm. And the reason why that change is important is that we want to reach out to many more children with our services, mm. all in line with the United Nations you know, policies and yeah. all that, especially the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Yes. And reaching out to many more children means that we need support. We can't do it all alone. Mm. You mentioned partnerships and all that. Mm. Yes, that is good. But the children we take care of are the children of Ghana. Okay. They belong to us. Okay. And taking care of children is a very, very difficult thing. But okay. we enjoy doing it. We have How can go. we do it better? We can do it better when we receive the support of partners like you, especially in the media. <laughs> right. You know? we, we so do. we call in all Ghanaians everywhere mm. to come to our, our support all right. to, to help the children of Ghana. Okay. So that we can reach out to many more to so, make Ghana a better place for them. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. It is Ifwa Hiagbe, Communication and Brands Manager for SOS Children's Villages in Ghana, and Josiah Bernard Nate, National Child Safeguarding Advisor, SOS Children's Villages in Ghana. Please support them if you can, because they are the children of Ghana.
There's still more to come on the AM show. Stick and stay. Thank you very much for joining us on the AM show. Now we're going to be talking a cashew and it has to do with the 6th Council of Ministers meeting, an expert meeting of the Consultative International Cashew Council officially opened in Accra. We're going to be talking a lot about this cash crop and what the plans are for the future. Joining the conversation, we have William Ejapong Equator. He is CEO of Tree Crops Development Authority together with Rita Weidinger. She is Programs Leader, Regional Value Chain Projects on Cashew with the German International Corporation, GIZ for short. Lady, gentlemen, thank you for joining. Thank you for having us. How did we get here? Let me start from there. How much progress have we made in, in the cashew sector? I'll start with you, Mr. Kwetu. Right. Um, the development of Ghana, we all know that uh, depends to a large extent on, on cocoa. And uh, a time came that uh, realizing that the Climatic, climatic conditions are changing. The lands that were available for cocoa is no longer able to support cocoa. So we needed to diversify. And so we looked at various crops. And cashew, over the years, have proven to be one of the uh, potential cash crops that can more or less uh, do the same thing that cocoa has done for Ghana. In fact, and even more. Yes, and even more. Because if you look at yes. the net price of a kilo, of, a ton of cashew vis-a-vis -vis cocoa. Uh, yes. The disparities are clear. It is. Uh, cashew is coming closer to cocoa. And very soon, I'm afraid, uh, it's possible that cashew may take over from cocoa. Mm. But just tell why. us, what, what can you tell us about the, the, the cashew fair and what attendees you are expecting for this particular program? Right. So you and I probably uh, have seen cashew before. But many people in Ghana have not seen even what cashew is. And in the local dialect, you go, you ask of the name of cashew in the local dialect, many people do not know it because they have not seen it and therefore do not even have a name for it. Admittedly, I do not know it. So you'd, you'd be informing all of us yes. in the local parlance, I yes. do not know what it is. So called. it is even recently that I got to know that uh, in, in Akan, we have a name called, uh, the name is uh, Atia. Okay? Atia. Atia. Growing up, oh, I never okay. knew cashew until I came I've heard cashew. that before. I didn't know though. Yeah, that that's, that's the local name for, to. that's the Akan name for cashew. It's called mm. Atia. Okay. And it's, it's quite, uh, uh, let me say, it's a new crop to, to, to us. Yeah. Maybe it used to be there. Our grandfathers used to see that and just eat the fruits, but they didn't know that the nut in there was something that had a very nutritious uh, 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 value yeah. and could help uh, boost immune system and all that. And so when scientists discovered this, and uh, we wanted to delve more into what it can do for the human being, this is what... Uh, the nutritious value and others. And, and people are not aware that the entire, the fruit can be used for so many things, even liqueurs and the rest. Yes. And the kennel, the shell in Brazil, you know, I worked in that industry. They would even use it to reinforce um, bricks yes. and other things. There yes. were so many uses for them, apart yes. from just the, yes. the kennel and, and uh, the fruit itself. Exactly so. But let me come to Rita now. What encouraged you to come on board to partner, uh, you know, the team for this fair? So I'm working for the German Corporation, but funding comes from European Union. We have from the Swiss Corporation, right. the German gov government, obviously, over the last 20 years. What attracts cashew is, once it's a tree crop, it's very good for climate mitigation. Mm. It was in the region also planted for soil coverage, yeah. just to uh, mitigate soil erosion. But then it's an excellent opportunity for employment creation. For women, it's use. also a cash crop. It's so a cash crop. It says others, the name yeah. already, yeah. Cashew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so others, they even name their companies Cash for You, Cashew. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, that there's a lot of employment in. When we see today, uh, 300 million US dollar per year for the economy of um, smallholder farmers, uh, people have it as part of their other commodities. And it comes at the time where it's also crucial where we need the money in the farm to buy the entrant for maize, for other annual crops, where we can pay employment, where we pay the third school fees. So it's really for the 
uh, marginal areas, um, Middle Belt, Northern uh, Ghana, it's an excellent revenue source. Mm. So this is like gold for development partners yeah. as we are. Yeah. And I happen to be 20 years now in Cashew, all over uh, Benin. We work on a regional level. And Ghana has really shown a huge, huge commitment and uh, drive, especially on the research side. Mm. We have the highest productivity on the farms today, with about a thousand uh, kilo per hectare. And when I came to Ghana many years ago, I don't say exactly, <laughs> for not guessing my age, <laughs> there we, we had um, only about 200 kilo per uh, hectare. So five times the five yield, fold development. five yeah. fold development. And that we can also see in the overall yield from 50,000 15 years ago, mm. 50,000 metric tons to today, 230,000 tons. And that's really due to the huge commitment of the Ghana government to engage in the crop. I would say first with a focus on production. Right. And that's now also shifting that we say we can eat it. Yeah. We can process it. Yeah. But only 8% is processed so far yeah. in yeah. Ghana and the rest is exported so we are throwing employments away we are throwing money away huge potential to develop it and as Honorable uh, William said it's really an opportunity for showcasing what we all we can do my favorite Indeed. stew is cashew nut stew and I don't I know whether you have see. eaten it with fufu interestingly I've done that with stew. so many other things but <laughs> not the soup Cash, cash you know, now, now that, I must try this. Now that you've mentioned it, I must try it. Yes. I know how it will go. Roasted, maybe salted a bit, and then crushed, yes. and then made kind of like groundnut soup. Groundnut soup. It's a like groundnut soup, but you use the um, cashew, cashew nut paste, mm. and it's delicious. It's, I've had the paste. Top, it's healthy. It's super healthy. It is. For it diabetics, is. Um, then for skin. Look at my skin. <laughs> <laughs> You won't get white, don't fear it. <laughs> right. But it's right. really, it, it's very nutritious. The apples we are not using at all, or hardly using it. Yeah. And the, the cashew apples, the we're cashew, talking about the fruit part of it. The fruit, the, yeah. uh, and that has about six times vitamin C than oranges. Yeah. It's thrown away. We might need, use it a bit as animal feed, yeah. and we who can really benefit of it. Like I said, there are drinks made of it and, and yeah, we, drink we, waste, we waste all of yes. these. In fact, that is one of those, just like cassava, it is one of those multi-purpose crops that you can do so many things Beautiful. with. Yeah. But it also depends on having the industry to be able to compartmentalize and make the most of it. But coming back to you, uh, she's mentioned a few things. You were saying that cashew prices are catching up. In fact, back when I was in the industry, cashew prices were higher than cocoa prices. And you ask yourself why we are not focusing more there, looking at the resilience of those trees and the soil that we have, especially in the Bono uh, part of our country. But how crucial is cashew to our economy, looking at its viability? Yes, uh, I would say that uh, the Ghana government has done a lot on cashew, mm. uh, going back to about 20 years ago when Ghana uh, embarked on a project called uh, uh, Cashew Development Projects. It was under the Ministry of uh, Food and Agriculture and then Cocoa Research Institute was also brought into the picture for the research side of it. And this is what has led to Ghana spearheading the research on, on cashew. In fact, in the sub-region here, Ghana is gradually becoming the hub for cashew research through uh, Cocoa Research Institute of, of Ghana. You talk about the fruits, there are several products that have been able to, uh, uh, Cocoa Research has been able to develop out of the, the fruits. And so it's leveled how to scale it up for industrialization. And so I would say that Ghana is paying much attention to cashew. And it is, cashew is one of the main crops that led to the establishment of uh, the Tree Crop Development Authority, an authority that is supposed to mimic the activities of Cocoa Board so that it will put six major crops, six major tree crops in the same light as we see. I, I remember that. I remember having an interaction with... Um Dr. Efri Akoto, Efri Akoto on some mm -hmm. of these. And that's yes. why we even have the kokoshi. Yes. The, yeah, kokoshi for sure. Yeah. Yes, and, and then um, we have... Uh, some of them have not turned out the way we would have wanted, but there's still room for improvement. Yes. Something has been done. Yes. More remains More, yes. to be done. But, but quickly on this, are there any special events you're going to be having uh, at the fair? Yes, uh, we, we have an affair 
So, and maybe you can talk about vendors as well. That we can yes, spend. so we're showcasing all the products that we can get from, from a, a cashew, right from the nut to the, for, to the fruits. Right. And then, of course, we also marketing the companies that are involved in the, in the cashew value chain. Uh, we also so vendors, exhibitors. Exhibitors. And then we're having this international conference. Okay? The international conference is, is a consultative uh, uh, conference initiative that we have come together to look at developing cashew to a higher level than we see it now. And you know that cashew, more or less, is grown in Africa and some parts of the Pacific. And so these are the countries that have come together to form the international cashew, uh, uh, consultative international cashew council. Mm -hmm. Annually we meet, uh, it moves from one country to another. We have, seven member, we have 11 members so far, and there are about five or so uh, member countries who are observers, they are observing and uh, willing to join in the, in the coming year. So at such conferences, we decide on what activities to do in the coming year. I mean, there, there are several things that we could do, ranging from uh, research, production, marketing, and then of course processing. So what are the key challenges in those areas? You see. The, the difference between the cashew nut, that is a raw cashew nut, and processed cashew nut is over 20. Yeah. It is sold, the, nut, the raw cashew nut is sold here in Ghana for about uh, 50 cents per kilo. But when it is processed, it is selling between 10 to about 20 yeah. uh, dollars. Yeah. You understand me? So look at the difference. 5 cents, uh, 50 cents to about 20 dollars. It means if kilo. you add value, yes, there's a whole lot more. You need to add value. value. Right. To the machinery and all that, and what it takes to get to that international market. Okay, we, are uh, we, we, we are pressed for time. We've already spoken about the health benefits. We've spoken about the developments over the years. Um, very quickly, what are some of the challenges, the bottlenecks um, in that sphere? And then I'll come back to you on how people can attend the fair, what they have to do, and then we'll wrap. So, what are some of the challenges currently that we, we all face, and GIZ supporting? So any new industry needs knowledge right. and knowledge is for us the key also to the economic development. Right. So we need to train people. We have regionally um, master right. training programs together with the ministry, together with private sector. There's a large Brazilian company here, Usibras, opening the doors, Winkers, um, a Ghanaian company opening their doors for learning also mm. so that we can do hands-on learning. Uh, we have designed TVET programs also all around the elements of cashew. We have to learn the grafting of the, the yeah. um, trees, to, uh, seedlings. So the to processes be, all through all from that, start to finish. Yes. That uh, one. Then we had worked a lot on the policies. I think all the documents to even establish Tree Crop Development Authority. Many right. actors were involved from World Bank, IFC. Right. Just to name a few. African Development Bank has gone into also investment products. Right. Uh, to finance the companies, they have to buy the raw cashew nuts uh, in a period of three months mm. and then to have the uh, product for the whole year to process. It's huge capital needs. All this needs good planning, good knowledge and then also a banking sector who understands how they can uh, support the companies. Yeah. And At some point, we'll have to have a conversation <laughs> on this. I see you're very passionate about it, and it, it's quite a convoluted one if we want to get into it. But in some 30 seconds, who can participate? How do people participate? Uh, what can we expect at the fair? Final one. Yes, so uh, it is open to the public, okay. and it's being held at the Air Force Alliance uh, Children's Park, okay. opposite Kempiski. So when you is walk this? In there. When? It started yesterday, okay. and so it's ending on Saturday. All right. So anyone can pass Yes, you can just pass through and have a feel of what, what cash is about and what potential. I see you have some final words. We really have to go, but yes. yes. A number for those who still want to exhibit, also who have cash products, 0244-621-364. Please repeat it. 0244-621-364. Come also with your cashew product, and if you have never tested cashew kebab or cashew nut soup, please Join us there. All right. It is worth. Thank you, uh, Rita Vidinga, Programs Leader, Regional Value Chain Project on Cashew. Uh, she's with the GIZ. And we also had William uh, Quaitu also joining uh, the conversation on uh, this beat. It's all about that cashew uh, fair that already has started. It's continuing and it will end when? Over the weekend.
Thank you, gentlemen, for joining. But up next, we have Big Chef. Oh, yeah, it's a new season and things are sizzling. You should look at the young ones doing their thing. That conversation up next on The AM Show. Episode 6 of Joy Prime's culinary extravaganza, Big Chef dubbed, My Father, My Hero, saw the 10 contestants join forces with their fathers to embark on the jollof and smoothie challenge. It was fun to see Daddy's chef it up in the kitchen for a change. So if you are ready, then our tax for the day is Tasty Tom jollof rice and Arumi smoothie. So you give us jollof and also give us smoothie at the same time. With 35 minutes to whip up their meals, fathers and wards quickly got to work. Official judge for the season, Chef Kofi Ajikum, reminded them to work within the time frame to avoid eviction. Once again, let me tell you, it's an eviction day. So if you fail, it means you are following your father back home. Okay? So please give us a very good jollof and then very nice and very chilled smoothie. Judges also expressed the excitement at seeing men spend time in the kitchen with their wards, a scene that is rare in many homes. The joy in the kitchen was visible on the faces of the contestants. Welcome back on the show. And what you were watching was the big chef, my hero, my father. And trust me, I was dancing here because I'd been in that kitchen, I think two years ago last year, and I know how hot it gets. But in the studio with me are some of the contestants with their parents, gentlemen and lady. Welcome to the show. Thank so you. let's do a quick introduction. You are? Jaden. Jaden and? Phyllis. Phyllis. And these are your fathers. Yes, my brother. You are? I am an uncle to Jaden. Oh, okay. Father figure. And name is? Yes. The name is Jesse Manfort. Jesse. Yes. And? I'm her young, uh, her elder brother. Name? I'm Stanley. Stanley. Okay. So Stanley and Jesse, how was it cooking in the kitchen with your children in the studio for the first time? How was the experience for you? It was such an experience. Yeah. Um, working under uh, limited time. <laughs> yeah. And cooking jollof. And we know at home jollof takes some time. Yes. But we had... Uh, 30 minutes to prep and do everything so it, it was such an experience and okay. it was difficult but Stanley did you enjoy yourself or did you find it too hot to handle <laughs> oh I was able to handle it yeah. I enjoyed myself but imagine cooking something that can easily disgrace you under short mm. time it was very competitive to um, handle but then at the end of the day I was able to like great well let me assistant. come back to my contestants here before this before last week's episode had you had the chance to cook with your fathers or your parents in the kitchen before in your homes JD yeah you did yeah. so how different was this one for you uh, for this um, done we did in the kitchen yeah was small fun like in the house yeah. because in the house you don't have all the contestants in the house cooking right a small kitchen. What about you, darling? Yes, I've been cooking with my brother. Okay. My family. So this is this was normal for you. Yeah. And I understand you were scared that it was an eviction episode, yeah. but it yeah. turns out that there was no eviction, no eviction at all. Yeah. Yes. How did you find that? It was actually never a kid because um, Chef Kofi told me that I'm evicted. So oh. yeah. meanwhile, okay. I was the first, uh, second best. Okay. Yeah. And your jollof all came out great. Yeah. Yeah. What should we look forward to next week in next week's episode? I know next week is really an eviction. There's not going to be another fake eviction episode. Are you ready? Yeah. What should yeah. we look forward to next week? Um, they should expect something massive from me and especially Team Prime, of course. What about you, JD? They should expect nothing but the best from Team Joy. Okay, so this is Team Joy and yeah. Team Prime. All right, so congratulations, and I Thank wish you, you all the very best. But any final words from the parents before we go? Well, I want to say that the, the show has been great. It's unearthing some potentials in the kids, mm. and so they should keep it up, and we would have very good chefs in the future. Okay, I'll take your words, and then we I go. I would want to say that the um, platform is such a great one for my younger sister to come on air to uh, unearth her potential with regards to cooking. 
and then I'm trying to, I want to tell everyone that they should expect nothing but the best from here throughout the competition. Big Chef, Good, good Meals by, by kids. kids. And it's right there for you to know that yeah. the, these children are doing fantastic work. Even as adults, some of us don't really do well in the kitchen. But, you know, if children are, you know, showing their culinary skills in the kitchen, it's, it's just so much fun to watch. So make a date next Sunday or this Sunday at 5 p.m. for the latest episode of The Big Chef. And it will be a, an eviction week. So just pray and hope that your choice of candidates doesn't see or doesn't bite hard at the end of eviction but that's how we're wrapping up for the am show today my name is sweetie abochi and i did this with benjamin akakbo so from us and the entire am team have a lovely morning congratulations